Uh, good morning. Can I welcome everyone to this, the 30th meeting of the Justice Committee in 2012. Can I ask everyone to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices completely as they interfere with the broadcasting system, even when switched to silent. I uh, have apologies from Jenny Mara, and I welcome Margaret McDougall, who is substituting for her on the committee today. Uh, item 1 in the agenda, decision on taking business in private. Are we agreeable to taking item 4 in private? Thank you. Item 2, Legislative Consent Memorandum on UK Prisons Interference with Wireless Telegraphy Bill. Um, this is an evidence session uh, on that bill. We have received a response from the Cabinet Secretary for Justice to our initial observations on the LCM and also a number of written submissions which we requested at an earlier meeting. And these are included as annexes to Paper 1. Can I welcome Rosanna Cunningham, Minister of Community Safety and Legal Affairs, Brian Ironside, Assistant Director of National Operations at the Scottish Prison Service, and Jim O'Neill, Senior Legal Policy Officer of the SPS. And Minister, I invite you to make an opening statement, please. Uh, thank you, Convener, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to discuss the uh, Legislative Consent Memorandum in relation to the prison's interference with wire wireless telegraphy bill. Uh, the bill uh, was introduced in the House of Commons on 20th June 2012 and provides powers to tackle the illicit use of electronic communications devices, including mobile telephones, within prisons. Uh, the powers in the bill will help to deal with the challenging problem of illicit mobile phone use in prisons uh, and will support our commitment to tackling serious and organised crime. The bill contains only five clauses, all of which will apply to Scotland. The three substantive clauses provide for the authorisation of interference with wireless telegraphy for the purpose of preventing, detecting or investigating the use of electronic communications devices, including mobile telephones, within prisons and similar institutions, safeguards which apply in relation to the granting of authorisations and the retention and disclosure of information obtained in accordance with an authorisation. And Clause 1 confers functions on Scottish ministers to authorise governors and directors of relevant institutions to interfere with wireless telegraphy. Clause 2 provides that Scottish ministers must be satisfied that the equipment that will be used as a result of the authorisation is fit for purpose before granting the authorisation. It provides that where an authorisation is granted, Scottish ministers must inform Ofcom uh, of that. It also provides that certain directions must be given by Scottish ministers to the governor or director of a prison or young offenders institution uh, who is authorised to interfere with wireless telegraphy. Uh, the bill sets out what matters such directions are to cover. These include requirements to provide information to Ofcom and the circumstances in which the use of the equipment under the authorisation must be modified or discontinued and in particular directions aimed at ensuring that the authorised interference will not result in disproportionate interference outside the relevant institution. Clause 3 of the Bill provides for the retention and disclosure of information obtained in accordance with an authorisation. This information is termed traffic data and includes data which is comprised in, attached to or logically associated with an electronic communication. This data could lead to the identification of the person using the phone, the phone type, the location to or from which the call is made, or the time and duration of the call. It does not include the content of the communication. It also provides important safeguards in relation to the retention and disclosure of information obtained, such as the requirement that such information must be destroyed no later than three months after it was obtained, unless the Governor or Director of the Prison or Young Offenders Institution has authorised its retention. Wireless telegraphy is a reserved matter under paragraph C10 of Schedule 5 to the Scotland Act 1998. However, the management of prisons is devolved. As the Bill confers functions on Scottish Ministers, the Bill is a relevant Bill as defined in Standing Orders Chapter 9b, Rule 9b, 1, Subsection 1. Other legislative mechanisms for the Scottish Parliament to achieve the provisions of this UK Bill have been considered, namely a Scottish Bill with a corresponding order made under Section 104 of the Scotland Act 1998. Whilst this route would be possible, it would be more complex, take more time and would involve substantially more resource. As the UK Bill has already been introduced, the LCM route offers a more resource-efficient and timely legislative vehicle by which to confer the required powers. We're committed to minimising the number of phones entering prisons, to find phones that have gotten in, and this power will allow us to disrupt those phones that we have yet to find and stop prisoners engaging in further criminal activities from prison. 
This will help both the police and prison authorities to maintain the security of our prisons and communities. We do recognise that this legislation is only the first step. Technology evolves constantly uh, and uh, uh, we will have to uh, evolve to keep up with that. But I ask the committee to support the legislative consent motion that has been laid before it and I'm happy to answer questions or my officials will be able to do so. Thank you. Any questions? David, then John Finney. Um, um, and then um, Graham Pearson. And then... Yes, Graham Pearson. I've got it right today. Sam White. I don't know why I've muddled you up. Right, David. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. Uh, I was wondering if you could explain to me, Minister, uh, precisely what is um, new uh, about uh, the bill? Well, the bill is uh, being put through the House of Commons at present. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, um, I think at the moment uh, there are um, pilot schemes taking place uh, south of the border only in respect of this, but there have been concerns raised about the fact that there is no uh, legislative power to uh, conduct this interference. And although, as I understand it, there's been no challenge to any of the pilots south of the border, Clearly, the Westminster uh, uh, officials and government felt uh, that it was uh, more sensible to actually ensure that there was a proper legislative uh, consent in place uh, uh, for this activity to take place. This is about, uh, you know, technologically interfering with signals, uh, and uh, uh, that's what's new, the, the, uh, the legal ability to do so uh, within prisons. Okay. Thank you, John Finney, followed by Graham Pearson. Thank you, Convener. Uh, Minister, um, you mentioned the term uh, pilot scheme. The, the, the papers we have make a lot of references to trials, and I appreciate that this is a, yeah, a, a, a fast um, developing um, area of technology. Um, I'm concerned about the proportionality of it. Can I say at the outset I'm fully supportive of the legislation and the need for it? Um, the only prison in the area I represent is in the middle of an urban area. And we've, we've heard from Ofcom in the papers about other radio services and the potential impact on that. Is anyone able to say that, for instance, things like telehealth and telecare won't be interfered with were this to be put in place? Well, I think that is all part of the process of, uh, of getting the authorisations to do so. I mean, it is about being proportionate. Uh, and I think if there were circumstances where there was a very serious likelihood of interference uh, in, uh, in activities such as that, uh, uh, then, uh, well, I wouldn't want to prejudge any particular decision that might take place. Uh, that would need to be taken into account before authorisation was given. Uh, I don't know whether or not uh, Jim O'Neill yeah, wants the, to add a comment there. I think the minister is correct. The legislation, the legislation only provides that it's lawful to do it within a prison. So a key part of exercising this power is to ensure that there's a rigorous testing of the equipment to ensure that there is no interference in, in such uh, areas out with the prison. I wonder if, if some supplementary please. Uh, regarding proportionality, the um, Information Commissioner's Office have suggested uh, that, uh, and I quote here, strongly recommends a full privacy impact assessment be undertaken prior to the implementation by the prison service, focusing particularly on human rights legislation and the risk of, to the privacy of non-prisoners. Can there be an assurance that that will be undertaken? Uh, well, some of what you're talking about, of course, will relate to the fact this is a Westminster bill. This is not a, this is not a Scottish bill. Uh, um, uh, and we will be watching very carefully anything uh, that they do undertake in respect of that. Uh, I can't answer for Westminster officials in respect of what they might or might not choose to do. Uh, uh, we would want to be uh, uh, very sure um, that, and again, this goes back to the issue about the, the proportionality of any decision, uh, that, uh, uh, that that is taken into account uh, when, uh, when a decision is made. Um, I understand exactly the point that is being made about the proximity of some prisons to built-up areas um, and the uh, necessity to ensure uh, that if anything is put in place that it does not effectively blanket a much wider area than simply the prison, which is what the primary purpose of any decision would be. Uh, but uh, uh, in terms of the technology that is available, uh, we understand at present uh, that it is possible to minimise that. And again, this is, you know, this is technology which evolves so fast um, uh, that it, it, isn't a, it isn't a case of what might or might not be possible now, will not be possible in six months or even a year's time. Uh, it evolves so quickly. 
Um, so even trialling right now, given the current technology right now, could potentially be out of date within six months or a year. Um, uh, this is simply about giving us the power to do this. Uh, it isn't about mandating it to happen in every circumstance. But it would be important to have public support for it, and, and part of that might be a consultation process. There hasn't been a consultation process to date. Would there be any consultation with communities adjacent to urban prisons where I think it could be a challenge? Uh, I don't think there's any intention at the moment to formally consult. I don't know whether or not the Westminster uh, uh, um, bill uh, ha carried with it prior formal consultation, uh, but clearly any, any intention to do so would mean that there would have to be uh, a local uh, consultation, which is more likely to be uh, uh, um, useful. Thank you, Graham Pearson, please, followed by Sam <coughs> White. Thanks, Convener. Uh, a couple of issues I wanted to, to ask about, and good morning. Um, where conversations are intercepted in, in telephone communications, there is an inspectorate, a commissioner, who oversees that process and monitors on an annual basis and reports that all is well, but otherwise, as, as they see fit. There's mention of Ofcom and, and connecting with Ofcom. Would it be the intentions that there would be a system of oversight, some form of independent uh, review to ensure that the powers are being properly used and are reported on? Do you want to answer that? Yeah. Actually, I think the concern would be where we actually intercepted conversation. That would not be the intention of the prison service just now. It is not legal intercept that we would be seeking here. It's merely the power to block um, the phones from connecting to the network in the first instance. So that would not be a consideration. And, and do you not think that there might be some value in having some kind of oversight to ensure that there is a consistency of approach and that proportionality is, is adhered to and so forth? Perhaps I, could pick up that point. Um, I think the, the, the key here will be the working relationship, the memorandum of understanding that we'll have with Ofcom, who have responsibility for regulation of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, and we will enter into an agreed memorandum of understanding with Ofcom and the mobile broadband group network operators, who, and that will provide some oversight and, uh, and sharing of communication and information uh, to ensure that that any interference is, uh, is proportionate. Mm. Ofcom is the appropriate regulatory body. Uh, I, there's no um, doubt about that. Um, but it doesn't prevent, uh, um, for example, Chief Inspector of Prisons um, looking at this, reporting on it in his inspections. And I think in the first instance, we would probably tend to rely uh, on that activity. Uh, um, as I said, this is not about this happening necessarily in every single prison or young offenders institution. And what I don't know at this stage is how likely the take-up uh, is going to be. I mean, that's obviously going to be a matter for individual governors and individual uh, institutions. Uh, but the uh, HM, uh, Majesty Inspector of Prisons, of course, is going to, is able to provide independent and impartial review of prisons uh, for the ministers. And I think in the first instance, um, uh, this would be one of the things that they, uh, he or she would look at. I'm grateful for that, uh, that point. The, the comment wasn't contained in the paper, and I think there is some need for someone out with the professional bodies to mm. have an oversight of how it operates. Second point I wanted to make, the, the paper indicates that there's, there's uh, no financial obligations to the public purse, but in reading the background papers, it's more expensive to purchase and to operate. Given the uh, current challenge to budgets within the service, uh, can we be assured that the lack of finance won't prevent appropriate use of the uh, mechanisms, the, the systems? Uh, or is there a worry there on behalf of the prison service? Can they afford to use it if they have the power? Well, I, I mean, obviously, perhaps Brian Ironside is best uh, at place to answer that. But uh, what you know, what we're indicating is that this would be a matter uh, uh, for uh, within this. Scottish Prison Service, and particularly uh, within those particular institutions, uh, 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 to make a decision about what they consider to be 
um, uh, the benefits or otherwise uh, of this, and they would do so within their existing budgets. But I don't know if Mr Ironside has anything further he wants to add. Very little to add to what the Minister has already said. Clearly, we need the powers. It's, it's a chicken and egg scenario. Without the powers, then we simply cannot investigate the benefits to be gleaned by the service from the introduction of such technology. But is, is the additional expense that's hinted at in the papers, are these substantial addi additional expenses or are they manageable? They are manageable at, 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 this, at this level, yes. Okay. How will the data be held um, and, and how will the, the access to the data be logged? I don't, think, uh, I don't think that we're able to provide a clear answer on that because it really depends on the technology that's deployed. Um, in general, there are two types of technology can be deployed. One, one simple blocking technology which does not gather any data and another technology which, which are colloquially termed grabbers which do effectively intercept the signal. Um, you know, how the data will be held will depend on the technology deployed. But as, as we are very early in the... You know, in, in this process, from a Scottish perspective, we have not, you know, we don't really have, um, you know, a firm idea of what the technology will be able to do in terms of data retention. I, I think this might be one of those areas where she you know, changes quite quickly as technology changes, and, and we all know the speed with which that happens, so that that will probably need to be a, an area of constant review, I would think, because uh, as, we, as we move forward, there will be uh, a likely... Um, uh, improvements in this technology and therefore the possibility of gleaning more information it becomes available and I think it would be a bit dangerous at this point to uh, specify what you were and were not going to in gather and how it was going to be uh, how it was going to be held because in six months time it could be it could be out of date and in a year or two's time it would almost certainly be out of date uh, um, and, and therefore I think it has to be remain relatively open at this stage. I think that what I was looking for was a commitment that it would be held both secure and, and properly monitored because so often these things aren't considered ahead of time and that uh, it's only with hindsight and lessons that are learned yeah. that, that we make up systems uh, prior to implementation. Final question for me, if I might. Uh, Prism Watch success. Uh, could you give me any, any indication why Prism Watch is deemed successful? What did it achieve? Well, uh, at the moment, it's uh, um, based at HMP Edinburgh, um, and uh, it was launched in February 2011. It's basically a crime prevention initiative, which is similar to Neighbourhood Watch, but the neighbourhoods uh, involved happen to be the neighbourhoods uh, around prisons. Um, and it, it does what it does is allows members of the public to report any suspicious uh, or criminal activity. Um, and allows for prompt action to be taken. And it does work alongside other, various other strategies. Uh, but it's a partnership scheme, and the results of the pilot at Edinburgh have been encouraging uh, because, put in place along with other measures, uh, there's been a reduction in the number of mobile phones, for example, given we're talking about that just now, uh, a reduction in the number of mobile phones or component parts of mobile phones found at HMP Edinburgh. Um, and this, uh, uh, I mean, obviously the technology that we're talking about in the LCM allows us to tackle those uh, uh, that have yet to be found. Um, so the, the success of it is such uh, that we uh, are, uh, it's currently operating at HNP Edinburgh, but it's also ongoing now at Greenock, Polmont, Peterhead and Aberdeen. Uh, but it is intended that the scheme will be rolled out to all prisons by spring 2013. So the early success that has been measured uh, suggests that it is worth doing uh, around all of our prisons. Uh, and it's simply mobilising uh, uh, the uh, ordinary abilities of ordinary people in communities around prisons to, uh, to report anything suspicious uh, uh, in terms of activity in and around the prisons. Uh, and if that is successful, then it will be one part of um, uh, what we hope is um, uh, um, more useful information coming in and uh, a better uh, control over what happens in prisons. Thank you. Can I just clarify that grabber, which you use, and it's a very interesting word. I saw the minister was quite taken with it. Uh, does, would that be able to track the mobile phone to its individual source? The, 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 the technology doesn't identify the individual, but what it identifies is, is data or, or information attached to the phone. For example, 
um, the, the, SIM, the SIM card reference number, for want of a better description, um, or the date or the time of the call is the kind of data that, that, that can be captured. So it, it, it might be able, therefore, to be traceable to whomsoever is using uh, eventually, use. not not immediately, yeah. but yes, that would that that be the starting point for further investigation. Thank you, uh, Sandra White. Thank, thank you very much, convener, and good morning, Minister. My understanding, it was a private members' bill from Westminster, which kick-started this, and the report that we have is because there is already legislation. It was deemed that uh, no public consultation was necessary. Is that correct? Colleagues, colleagues out of the border did not consider public consultation necessary simply because it's already an offence to have a mobile phone in a prison. Um, so they saw this as just a, uh, you know, a, a, an extension of, of tackling illicit mobile phone use in prisons. Thank you very much. The other issue I wanted to raise was the financial issue. I know others have raised it also. Uh, the report that we have mentions the fact that uh, it could be up to a million pounds at the top range, but therefore it didn't necessarily need to be a million pounds. I just wanted to reiterate the question. Uh, the prison services, if it was top range a million pounds, would it be affordable to use this in certain prisons or all prisons? Well, I mean, each institution will have to make its own decision about whether or not it, uh, it considers it appropriate, and I would be uh, uh, astonished if uh, every single institution immediately wanted to go th straight to the top range. I I'd be surprised, as I suspect uh, uh, most people in the prison service would be surprised. There will be prisons, uh, perhaps, uh, at which this would be considered, uh, that would be considered the most appropriate thing to do, and others uh, that perhaps might not consider that they needed uh, anything like that. Uh, so um, it's, it's hard to answer that question because it will be uh, a, a very much um, an institution-driven uh, demand uh, and they will have to take into account all relevant factors, including cost, when they, when they come to a decision about making that demand. Just, uh, thank you. Can you just a, a last question, and it's to do with um, safeguards for members of the public. Uh, obviously, you're seeing it, it's actually a moving feast, this particular one. This is just the start, and it could move on. Uh, I have concerns regarding, obviously, interference out with the prison, and obviously in Glasgow, Berlin is the biggest one that's uh, set in practically the middle of a housing scheme and the collection of data, and it's been saved for three months. At this moment in time, you see it's only collecting uh, data from SIM cards, etc. If data was collected and it was identified it was a member of the public, the member of the public able to get that data? Do they know that you know that you have got that data? And what happens after three months? I think the key is to try and avoid that ever happening, and that's where the the importance of the rigorous testing of the equipment, ensuring that we contain leakage, and you know, so that it doesn't you know, if you're employing, if you employ grabber technology, so that you avoid that happening in the first place. That's the absolute key. But there are some factors which, which are some that are in some respects out with control. For example, if a mobile network operator was to erect a mask close by, that may well push the, the, the interference, for example, out with the boundary. And colleagues down south uh, in, their, in their trials or pilots to date um, test the interference. Uh, on, they have tested it on a yearly basis to, to ensure that you know, the, the leakage any leakage is contained to the prison boundary as near to as, as is possible. Um, and in turn, Ofcom, uh, as a regulator and the mobile network operators, have been monitoring the situation down south. And it's encouraging that they have had no complaints from members of the public about any impact or outside the, the, the prison walls. Thank you, Kavira. That, that was, I was going to ask that as a follow-up about uh -huh. the reports. I think it's, it's a fair point, Sandra White. The, the what-if question. What Absolutely. If, and and um, I don't know if you've fully answered well, that, but what if I think, I somebody think, comes and finds it's been blocked? I mean, I think, I think you, cannot, you cannot say that it will never, ever happen mm. because there are, there are factors okay. that in some respects are out with our control. The key for us is that the key that this legislation provides is that it's only, uh, it's only able to exercise this power within the prison. Um, uh, may, might some of these data captures they walk by a prison you know an open prison in the middle of a rural area and they happen to be walking past that may well happen the key then is to sift out that data and get rid of it and destroy it so because it's not necessary 
Uh, we may want to follow this through in our, our consideration. I, I'm, I'm aware of the Minister's a commitment elsewhere, so I'll take a brief last question. Yeah, very quick point. I think we've um, aired this fully. Who is, if anyone, is going to be charged with kind of keeping a register of authorisations? Scottish Minister, they will be, the authorisation will come from, from the Scottish Prison Service headquarters. It will be, yeah, it, it, it will be through SPS uh, and the and Cabinet we'll, Secretary. Yes, uh, yeah. a very similar arrangement as to what is currently in place under RIPSA. We, we will authorise our own activity. Uh, a, register, a central register will be kept by the Prison Service. It will be available for scrutiny by the Office of the Surveillance Commissioner, as is currently the case. Okay, thanks. Right, I'm going to, I'm aware that it comes out, so I thank you for your attendance uh, and I'm uh, you may wish to move to your next uh, committee, as I understand it. We'll be grateful for I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're delighted to go. Uh, and can I just say to uh, members that we're required to report the Parliament on this LCM. And given the tight timescale, um, I, I think it, if you would agree, well, clerks would circulate a draft report. Now, I, you've raised some important issues, you know, about uh, uh, catchment of calls that may not be considered and what one does with data and so on. So I would ask the clerks, obviously, we'll consider this and we'll circulate a draft report this afternoon if members are happy to sign this off. Is that fine with everyone? Thank yeah. you very much. Now we move on to item three, budget scrutiny. And I'll just pause for a few minutes. Don't leave your seats. You're not getting a break. Um, and I'll let the next panel take their positions, please. As I'll say, <coughs> panel is to focus on the court's budget. Um, and the second, we'll look at the financing of the Commission on Women Offenders Findings and refer member to the papers that they have. I think you're all sitting comfortably, as someone said, so I'll begin. Uh, can I welcome John Lowe, Procurator Fiscal, East of Scotland, Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, Stuart Naismith, Convener of the Access to Justice Committee, Law Society of Scotland, Brian Carroll, TUS Scottish Court Service Branch Secretary, Public and Commercial Services Union, Eric McQueen, Chief Executive Scottish Court Service, and Susan Gallagher, Deputy Chief Executive Business Delivery, Victim Support Scotland. Welcome this morning and thank you very much for your written submissions, which were very helpful. And I go straight to members' questions, if you let me know. And if you've not been a uh, panel here before, you simply indicate that you wish uh, to take a question. One might be directed specifically at you. If not, just indicate and I'll call you and I'll make sure if you want to come in that I let you know in advance um, if you want to come in a supplementary. So, Questions from members, please. Rod Campbell. Good morning, um, panel. Um, I'd just like to kick off, really, a question of the impact of uh, uh, proposed um, courts restructuring on uh, the budget, which we're asked to consider. Could we, Mr McQueen perhaps comment on what uh, the impact will be in terms of the draft budget scrutiny for 2013-14? Sorry, the, the impact of the court structures. But bearing in mind the court restructuring is obviously still in consultation phase, yes. how it's all going to impact is still to some degree in the future. I just wanted uh, some comment from you on how it would actually impact on the budget we're considering at the moment. Okay. I mean, if you permit me, I think it's helpful just to give some context to that, first of all. Um, quite clearly, we are facing significant budget reductions, 20% over the, the four years of the, the spending review. And a lot of our costs are tying what we call fixed costs. Um, about 80% of our expenditures in terms of staff and buildings, and the remaining 20% is in demand-driven costs. So we don't have much flexibility in terms of our budget or discretion areas where we can try to limit our expenditure. Over the last two years, we've had what we call, I suppose, a coping strategy about how do we reduce our fixed costs um, expenditure for the organisation. So we have made some quite significant progress in that area. We have reduced our our staff numbers over the last number of years, and that has generated some savings of about 3.7 million. 
um, we have reduced the reliance in terms of part-time sheriffs. We have a cut back in the actual sitting days that exist within the court system, and that will, by the end of next year, have released another one and a half million pound. Um, we've also consolidated the number of JP courts um, already and moved them into sheriff courts, again saving about half a million pound. And we've looked quite extensively at our whole supply and services, our procurement, our corporate organisation, which again have reduced our, our spend base by about £2 million. So this combination of factors have got us into a position where we can see ourselves through the financial um, reductions that we see for the coming year in 2013-14. It does take us to the position as, as to how far can we just go cutting parts of the organisation. Um, there does become a limit that it starts to in fact impact quite significantly on service delivery. If we continued in that vein, we would have to reduce staff numbers further by maybe 50 or 100 staff. We would have to reduce part-time share of sitting days by maybe another 1,000 or 1,500 days. And that would take us to a position probably in about 12 or 18 months' time where we had an organisation where we had a disparity in work between workload and staff. Uh, we would have a reduction in court sitting days that would be impacting on criminal delays, and we would see criminal delays going out somewhere between about four to six, eight weeks over a sort of 12 or an 18 month period. So, if we just carried on cutting our budget, we would end up in quite a, a difficult position and a position that was hard to maintain. So, what we are looking now is the second part of our strategy, which is actually about starting to transform the organisation. So how do we change our structures? How do we change the services that we deliver? And we see the court structures element as being quite an important part of that, about reducing our ongoing cost base and also trying to think about well, how does that facilitate and accommodate the justice reforms that are going to be coming our way? Because our view in the future is that what we will see is a justice system that does look very different. Um, the significant reforms that are coming through from the major judicial reviews will impact on the court delivery over the next number of years. We will see a model where there is much greater judicial specialisation, um, more centralisation of some of those types of service. And our view is that that moves us away from the, the generalist model at the moment, where we have sheriff courts that provide pretty much the same service across the country, to one that's much more based on specialisms. And that's why we see a, a model in the future of a, a smaller number of main centres that deal with the more serious level of business and a wider network of smaller courts providing the service at the more local level. So we see court structures as being an important part of the platform, one, to reduce our, our cost base, but secondly, look to how does it help us facilitate justice reforms that we know are coming our way. Yeah, that is, what, what level of savings, if uh, the proposals you have in the court restructuring document are implemented, what level of savings over the next two years will there be? Once they are fully implemented, the level of savings will be £2 million per year um, in terms of savings run, annual running cost. Um, we will avoid backlog maintenance in terms of essential maintenance required in these buildings of round about £4 million. Um, and quite clearly, what we hope to do from some of those buildings is generate um, capital receipts from sale of buildings that we could use to reinvest. You're not planning to implement them over the next two years? I, I mean... Uh in the court services document, I've got total net savings figure, which is not a net saving. It's a, uh, it's a, an additional expenditure of six hundred and twenty thousand for two hundred and thirty two thousand thirteen fourteen, and nine hundred and eighty thousand for two hundred and fourteen fifteen. So, yeah. So, yeah, so the, these are these are part of the cost to actually implement the full set of proposals that they came through. So we yeah, expect so that there will be implementation costs of around about eight hundred thousand. And there may well be some capital costs of potentially about 1.4 million if we decided to invest in additional capacity in some of our larger court areas. So what we've tried to draw out is a, um, a very realistic view of what we genuinely think can be delivered by savings and a quite fulsome estimate of what we think might be required to upgrade the estate and allow some of these changes to take place. Savings aren't in the next two years. The £2 million savings are not in the next two years. No, I mean, they would, they would start to come through progressively as it was implemented, depending on what that programme shapes up like. And I say that's why for 2013 we would not be dependent on those savings coming through in that financial year. They would start to emerge as the years moved on from there. Hey, could I just ask a, a further question, if I may? Just on, it's on it's, Well, it is. It's on kind of, well, it's on the, the capital funding. Uh, in your written submission, you say because of £2 million required for essential maintenance and upgrading of court or, uh, SCS ICT systems, leaving little for ongoing maintenance of the remaining SCS estate. 
um, how little is little? Um, little is not a lot. I mean, it basically is getting by. Um, I mean, by the end of the spending review, our capital budget will be £4 million. Um, and as I said, the predominantly £2 million is invested in IT, £2 million available for the building. Um, our programme on the capital side will see us maintaining compliance in those areas in terms of our legal obligations, health and safety, and essential repairs. It doesn't allow any additional funding for investment, for improving facilities, um, or for any major disasters that we may have in the court of states. If a, a roof collapsed in Edinburgh Sheriff Court and cost us £10 billion, um, we would not have funding for that. And the, the Lord President has been quite clear we would need to go back to the Scottish Government for those emergency situations if they arose in the future. So it, it would be a very tight budget and it would be about compliance. Margaret, there. I want to just uh, clarify something with you. You talk about savings, that's to your budget. Yes. But would you accept that savings to your budget might imply costs to another budget? Um, I think like, if I may just give you an example, it's pretty parochial, but it, I think it's valid. Yeah. I have people share of court my constituency where the police station and the court are in the one building. Now, if that were to close, it would mean police would have to travel to Edinburgh, sit there all day, come back, or sometimes there'd be an adjournment of a trial and come back. As it is just now, there's efficiency made within that building. I'm not, it may pertain in other areas or not. You see, there's an area where, in coming forward with something, and I understand you, you budget, mm -hmm. but there might be implications for the police budget or some other budget. Would you accept that there is a, might be a robbing Peter to pay Paul? Um, I, mean, I think it's a very right and valid question to answer, and I think we have tried to address some of that in the consultation document. As we've developed these proposals from the very start, we have heavily involved other justice partners in, in, within the, the discussions. Um, so the police, the Crown Office, Legal Aid Board um, have made their own assessment of the overall impact and any unintended consequence of their organisations. And the view coming back from those organisations is that they would expect the, across the board, the impact to either be cost neutral or potentially generate some small savings. And I think part of the thing that we've got to look at as well, well, how does this change in the future, in a sense? Um, so at the moment in Peebles, um, yes, you have the police station there, and, and, and yes, it's together. Um, in future, with a standby scheme that's been agreed with the police, the idea is that police officers will be based somewhere between 30 minutes or an hour from the court that they're due to give evidence in, and they won't be required to travel to that court unless they're certain that that case is actually going to head. About 90% of police officers at the moment spend time sitting in court for cases that are not called. So the whole part of the reforms is not just about the structural reforms, but actually trying to look at how do we manage business better in the future and how do we manage the whole issue about police witnesses. So right. it's, you know, it's not just a, a simple answer about court structures. And, and, and I hear that. I'm not going to pursue this at this moment because I want other members to come in and I don't want to just stick to my own constituency, which would be unfair to uh, committee members. But I'm, I'm in the, across the piece, I'm a wee bit concerned that like you seem to be saying that it's cost neutral for legal aid board, for the police and so on. That's what you appear to be saying. And, and that's the response in the consultation report from those individual organisations. I think we'll pursue that. I'm, I'm, I'm going to let other panellists and then, Margaret, you want to come in with a supplementary. So, Brian Carroll and Stuart Neesmith. Thank you, Convener, and good morning. I was really just <coughs> asked the question on, you've given consideration to reducing the number of buildings that you have within the prison estate uh, and within the court estate, sorry. So, have you given any consideration to energy efficiency and carbon emissions in the buildings that you will uh, continue to use? Um, we certainly have. I mean, we have quite an active carbon management plan in the organisation. And despite the fact that we do operate out of largely Victorian buildings, which are not normal the type of buildings where you would exceed, we are seen very much as being an exemplar um, across the country in terms of what we have done in carbon management. Um, there's no doubt that in terms of some of these proposals, some of them may actually increase in more travel distances. So there is an issue here, um, perhaps in terms of unintended consequences about carbon management. But again, we have tried to cover that within the consultation document, and we don't believe it will have a major ability on our impact to meet future targets. Thank you. I've got John Finney followed by Sandra White. Thank you, Convener. It's a question for Mr Carroll about staffing. Oh, I'm so sorry. I forgot I was going to let everybody else in. Have I not let anybody else in? Who, who else was to come in there before, before I take you? Brian Carroll followed by Stuart Naismith. Is that correct? Thank you. I'm so sorry. Yes, um, PCS Union would just like to uh, comment on the fact that 
The revenue budget for Scottish Court Service has actually been cut from the 2010 level of 73.6 million to 65.4 million by 2014, which is an 11% cut. The capital expenditure budget from a 2010 level of 20.3 20 million, reducing to 4 million pounds by 2014, which is an 80% cut. The fear for PCS uh, Union is that this is cutting just, justice and making justice fit into the budget, rather than actually looking at the delivery of justice and how justice should be delivered in the future for the best quality of service to be given to the, the people of Scotland and the citizens of, citizens of Scotland and the citizens, citizens of modern Scotland's uh, society. There has been efficiencies made, as has been said by uh, Mr McQueen, and one of the uh, ways that that has been done is that 120 staff uh, were uh, exited from Scottish Court Service through the voluntary uh, redundancy scheme. If, as Mr McQueen says, these budget or proposals for future court structures don't go through, then there is a danger that further staffing will be cut. Having said that, Mr McQueen has also said that we are at a level of staffing currently that we are able to deliver justice to Scotland in the way that we should be able to deliver. Any future cuts would put that at risk. So I take it's buildings, not bodies, you're talking about here. It's buildings, not bodies yeah. at the moment. But if the buildings yeah. don't go, then we are at a current level at the moment where we are delivering what we are expected to deliver for the citizens of Scotland. If those staffing levels are cut any further, then we would not be able to uh, deliver that. But on the same token, Mr McQueen has also said that we are at a current level at yep. the moment that we are able to deliver. If it went any lower than that, we wouldn't be able to deliver. And we see that as a big risk. Which brings us to Mr Stuart Naismith and access uh, uh, to thank justice. Thank you, uh, I'd like to uh, echo some of what Brian's just said. Uh, 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 from the, the Law Society's perspective and this perspective of solicitor to practice in the courts, we uh, acknowledge the requirement for budgets to be balanced and uh, for difficult economic decisions to be made. But as Brian has hinted at there, you know, the, the administration of justice, the rule of law, is at the key of our the core of our society. Sorry. And uh, court closures mean very different things to different people. To set it in context, uh, we see almost no connection in the use of courts between the use of the courts for criminal justice, for the use of the court for civil justice, and for the use of the courts for family law. The common denominator is the judge, the procedures, the locus, the security requirements, the infrastructure, they are completely separate actually. And uh, the uh, Scottish Courts Administration's consultative document with its uh, overview of reforms and the issues raised, the, that, that's a good piece of work in, in, in my view. It does highlight very much the issues. But as we move into today's discussion, which is focused on budgets, uh, from our perspective, we really wonder how much is actually being saved here uh, and, and what are the unintended consequences. Um, I understand, of course, that Eric can't speak for other organisations, but it's inconceivable to practitioners that closing courts would be cost neutral for other organisations. There will be obvious impacts on witness expenses in, in, in connection with people having greater distances to travel to courts. This must inevitably impact on the payer of witness fees. Those are the Crown Office in relation to criminal proceedings and the Scottish Legal Aid Board for a significant proportion of civil proceedings. Uh, and so there must be an impact there. And uh, we wonder whether some of the cost savings identified in this document are effectively de minimis uh, uh, overall. And uh, I, I think uh, scrutiny should be certainly made of the, the risks, uh, and we believe there are real risks, of unintentional consequences of court closure. Thank you very much. And no other panellists at the moment asked to so We're still on costs, not on perhaps the quality of justice, which might be another issue. John Finney, followed by Sandra White, followed by Colin Keir. Uh, thank you, Camina. Uh, Mr Carroll, in the written submission we have from the Scottish Court Service, about corporate planning, we're told that skilled, engaged and motivated staff in our courts uh, are important to the successful delivery. 
We are also told, and you alluded to the figure, that the staff headcount was reduced by 120, and then the phrase used, mainly through voluntary redundancy. So I have, I have two questions relating to that, please. Can you tell me, if not through voluntary redundancy, how some of these staff uh, did leave the service? And we are also told that there are <coughs> further smaller staff reductions, reductions planned for 20. 13-14. In your individual submission, you refer to um, something called the SCS Dialogue Events, which I don't understand you to find them very successful. Can you tell us something about them and the relationship there and uh, your staff's reaction to it? Okay. The, the, the staffing situation is that, as far as I understand from the figures, 120 staff left Scottish Court Service through the Voluntary Redundancy Scheme. There may have been some early retirements in that as well. Further reductions are being talked about, I think, somewhere between 30 and 40 staff by 2014-15 through natural wastage. So that would mean that people leaving wouldn't be replaced, the posts wouldn't be replaced. But a uh, Scottish Court Service have certainly given assurance uh, to staff that as far as they are concerned, currently there would be no further voluntary redundancy, redundancy scheme and there certainly would not be any compulsory redundancies, but we do have the no compulsory redundancy guarantee uh, sitting there. In terms of the dialogue um, events, I attended uh, three of those dialogue events along with my, my colleague, uh, the branch chair, and throughout the branch we covered all those dialogue events. There were six in total all the way from Aberdeen to uh, Dumfries. What we found at the dialogue events was that uh, Scottish courts were saying that they were listening um, about what was being said at the, the dialogue events by all parties that had been invited and that they would take cognizance of that before the consultation came out. For our part, I think there was two uh, parts of the, the dialogue uh, events which we felt um, were basically uh, ignored and um, because of that we remain unconvinced by some of the arguments put forward in the consultation paper and feel that the primary motivation is to cut costs. There is no doubt that uh, in terms of uh, staff skilled, engaged and motivated staff that Scottish Court Service uh, do implement a lot in that regard and they work with us uh, within the, the TUS uh, to, to put various uh, ideas and implement uh, projects and plans in terms of that. We, we help uh, uh, with that. But this is having a big uh, impact on uh, the motivation of, of staff and it is having a big impact on the morale of, of staff. And there are significant issues uh, still to be addressed within the organisation from the unification uh, process which took place when Scottish Court Service took over the management of the district courts and they became G Co uh, JP courts under the auspices uh, of the management of Scottish Court Service. In the TUS we are still dealing with issues that cropped up during that process and we're already hearing uh, from, from members of staff throughout the, the, the court service that similar issues are already cropping up. For example, we have a member of staff from a court which has proposed foreclosure working in another court who is already saying that staff are saying to, to them, um, where are we going to put you? Where are we going to put the business? So it is a big worry. You do accept, however, I think, are you accepting this 20% cut in the budget over four years in the court's budget, which is what I think, I'm proud of his, Mr McQueen, that we are where we are. Yes, we are, we are where yes. we are, but what PCS Union uh, Well, absolutely understand you take. taking your position for, absolutely, for your staff, but it's just to clarify that we're, we're talking about the same and it's how we do it yes. uh, in the fairest way and without impacting too much on the delivery of actual justice. At the end of the day, that's the key thing, isn't it? Of course. That we have the courts operating properly. Mr McQueen. 
Yeah, I mean, I just want to make a couple of points. I mean, first of all, can I just say we have an excellent relationship with the trade union side in the Scottish Court Service. I can see um, that in your body language. Very strong. <laughs> I saw that. A very strong partnership, and we're, we're very grateful. I had grateful. to make you move your chairs apart, we, <laughs> not to make it so obvious. We, we, we are very grateful for their input. <laughs> Um, just to clarify, we did lose 120 staff from the organisation, as Brian says. Um, 96 of those staff were through the voluntary early severance, and the remaining 24 were through unfilled vacancies and, and just natural um, losses that we had at that particular time. We have lost about another 12 to 14 staff during this year, and that is planned again for next year. So that's just confirming the figures that, that Brian says earlier. We have worked very hard with our staff about this whole issue about staff motivation um, and done it very much in partnership with the trade union side. And just recently at a staff event last week where we had about 100 managers of all grades from all across the organisation, the three things that they said to us most clearly is that they were very clear on the future direction of the Scottish Court Service, that they felt that the whole issue of how we had, had handled staff reductions was very well handled. Um, and that the court structures in terms of its dialogue, its discussion, our openness and transparency um, was one that they thought, again, we had handled very well. So we have focused very much on the staff side and trying to make sure that we bring staff with us through, through what is quite a difficult process. Um, I just want to comment very briefly, if you don't mind, on the dialogue events. Um, these were six events throughout Scotland where we invited a range of stakeholders or organisations that were involved in the justice system. Um, a lot of members of the local faculty, a lot of the third sector groups, to discuss the ideas and discuss the proposals in a very open way. And that did account to quite a significant amount of changes from our earlier proposals. So we have changed our position on the High Court, where largely the proposals were uncontroversial. We had thought about having a more reduced High Court circuit, where in fact we have said that the main business should now be done in three centres. And again, that was based on feedback from the, the dialogue events. We have, in terms of our future plans, if we go down the route for jury centres, um, added in Dumfries and Perth, again, due to feedback from those dialogue events about some of the rural areas. And we have also kept, in a share of courts, Tain, Selkirk and Lanark, um, again, based on feedback from those dialogue events. So we have been listening to people as we've been developing these processes, and we will stay open to views as we go through the consultation period. And Mr Cowley, you're not going to fall out with each other, are you now? Well, of course not. No. Oh, good. I would echo uh, what Mr McQueen oh. said at the, the start of uh, his answer there in terms of the, the partnership working within Scottish Court Service. It was just to come back on the question of the, the dialogue events. I lost my train of thought when I was uh, giving uh, the answer. Um, but during the, the dialogue events, there was uh, points made from all in attendance that the dialogue events had possibly concentrated on criminal court work um, and it was the point was uh, very strenuously made at each of the dialogue events that civil business should be taken into account in this as well because it affects civil business as much as it affects um, criminal uh, business and it's not just the numbers in terms of civil business or criminal business the complexity of the work that is being dealt with by the staff and the, the judiciary and the management of Scottish Court Service is increasing daily as the, the new legislation comes through. And that really has to be taken into account as well because the complexity of the work increases the court time in which it needs to deal with that work. Further on the, the, the point of um, the, the budgets and coming back to the, the budgets, the, the dialogue events um, did uh, maybe make criticism as, a, as a, a bit strong, but certainly the points were made at the dialogue events that there wasn't enough uh, information given during the dialogue events about the, the budget proposal and what savings would necessarily be made. Because... Um, one fear that we have that this could just be deferring costs for the future. If you don't spend on maintenance, the fabric of the buildings uh, decreases vastly in proportion to what needs spent. And then it's not just uh, the painting of the windows that you need, it's the replacement of the windows or even uh, greater parts of the building. So I think deferred costs in terms against balancing that against the savings should also be uh, borne in mind and is quite a significant uh, factor in deciding whether the budget cuts will impact on the delivery of justice or not.
Uh, Sandra White, please. Th thank you very much, convener, and uh, good good morning, everyone. I'm interested in you know how it will affect other court users, uh, you know witnesses, you know victims, that type of thing as well. Now we are looking at uh, structural reform, and uh, you know some of the parts of structural reform is obviously to reduce the, the estate, basically, and planning to have specialist centres also. And I look at uh, victim support submission, where they have, you know, bullet point, I think, at least 12 issues that they're, they're not concerned about, they'd like to see happening. And I think probably my question is, how will it impact on other court users if these uh, smaller courts or whatever in different areas were to close? Uh, and is there a positive aspect to it in relation to um, victim support submission where they mention for the safety aspects, separate exits, entrances, facilities, that type of thing. So I'll throw it open to everyone if they could give me their opinion on that. Susan Gallagher. Thank you very much for that. I think for victim support's perspective, it falls into two camps. And the questions that we need to ask are whether or not these court closures and the potential cuts actually increase justice and people's public confidence in the justice system in Scotland. And at the moment, we're kind of looking at the issues and thinking, well, we're not sure that actually justice can be seen to be visible if we're actually going to remove it from some of our local communities. The second issue is to do, from our perspective, about the quality of evidence. If you are potentially closing a court, and if we use, for example, that of Rothsey, where victims and witnesses are therefore going to have a considerable distance to travel to Greenock on ferries and buses that potentially may not actually run, um, then we do have an issue with people being stressed before they even enter the court arena. The second area in relation to that is also to do with support and protection of people. We know in our courts at the moment that people walking into the court arena sometimes feel extremely tim intimidated before they even get into the building. The chances of people being intimidated in their local communities when they have to share a bus or a ferry with the accused and their family increases significantly. And for us, that is a real, real issue, not just only in terms of cost and travel and distances, but in people's confidence in their ability to give their best evidence. And I think that we need to look at that because that could significantly cause distress uh, for people moving forward. Then they'll switch to comment, Mr. Carroll. We would certainly echo uh, what has been said uh, there. Budget cuts, from a PCS point of view, impact uh, on the most vulnerable in society. They impact on the, the poorest of society. And costs will increase for the most vulnerable and the most poor, uh, poor people in society if they are uh, being made to travel uh, further with the increased cost uh, that that entails, and that will have a big, big impact on the, the delivery of justice in Scotland, and is a big risk to the confidence of the, the people of Scotland that they will have in the delivery of that justice, the impartiality of that justice, and the transparency of that justice. I would also like to uh, come in and make the, the point that some of what is proposed here is based on the diversion um, of business away from the courts through direct measures and also fiscal fines. What we are finding in PCS, and it is only anecdotal at this, this stage, so I believe this to be the, the position, is that we have uh, an organisation, the, the Procurator Fiscal, that was once independent. They were the prosecutor within Scotland. They did no other function. What we have now is a prosecutor who is not only prosecuting but is making a decision whether someone should come to court or not and is also possibly imposing fines. We have fiscal fines in place. So the impartiality and the independence of the, the justice system, I think, is called into to question on the dependence of the diversion of a business away from the courts. Business should be decided in the courts by the independence of the judiciary. It is them that should be deciding on whether uh, people uh, should be found guilty or found not guilty, and it is them that should decide whether there are fines imposed, custodial sentences imposed, or community payback orders imposed. But in terms of budget, um, it is uh, the, the poor and the most vulnerable in society that may have are compelled uh, to use the courts or may have to, to use the courts in some other way, which will be impacted upon greatly by what is proposed. 
strangely enough, Mr. Carroll, I anticipated Mr. Logue coming in after those remarks, and needless to say, his finger was up in there immediately, so on you go. You back for myself. the prosecution service I and your lack of independence, I think, uh, you're being... I would hate to disappoint any expectations. Um, could I, yes, could I... <laughs> Could I we'll take, see. Well, I, I, I will do my best not to, but um, could I pick up the point about the independence? Because I think that is the first time I think I've heard the suggestion that somehow there is a link between um, the proposals for court restructuring and the way in which the fiscal service operates. The What I maintain is, is its independent decision-making in relation to the appropriate outcome for each case. Um, there is, uh, Mr Carroll referred to direct measures, there is nothing new in the principle of direct measures. Procurators Fiscal have been issuing direct measures, um, certainly in the form of fiscal fines since the mid-1980s, and therefore there is no uh, connection between the issue of fiscal fines and the question of court restructuring. We have been involved as an organisation with the Scottish Court Service and others in looking at the consequences of court restructuring. It's not for the Procurator Fiscal Service to say or to form a view as to where there should be courts in the country. It is our responsibility to provide a service at those courts wherever they are provided. Um, but I, I, I can say confidently to the committee that at no part in that work, at, on no occasion during that work with the court service, has the question of the use of the prosecutorial discretion um, been discussed in relation to the issue of court restructuring. It simply isn't an issue um, in relation to the um, the, the the eventual outcome as to where there will be courts providing a service to the public in Scotland. Over to you, Mr. Carroll. PCS position would be that there is a risk that direct measures and the fiscal fines will be used to lessen the business going through the court to allow for the court closures, because otherwise the capacity for the business won't be there. I, thank you. Just, just uh, a final response to that then, perhaps. Um, I can give a categorical assurance um, on behalf of the law officers that uh, direct measures will not be used in any way to facilitate court closures. What we are looking at very closely as part of our work with the court service is how we can make other changes to the way in which the criminal justice system operates, other improvements which, together with court restructuring, will produce overall, um, we think, uh, an improved service in terms of the, the criminal justice system. Other matters are you giving consideration to? Well, I, uh, I, I wasn't sure if, if this was the appropriate point to go into them in detail, but we have, for oh, example, uh, some examples. Um, we have been uh, putting some effort into improved communication with, with witnesses. This month we implemented, on a national basis, an improved... Uh, communication ability with all witnesses, uh, reminding them by text message when the, the case was going to be coming to court as a trial. That was something that we piloted in Edinburgh Sheriff Court at the beginning of the year, and the initial outcome was very favourable. Of all the people who received a text message reminding them to come to court, 7% said that they wouldn't have come to court if they hadn't received that reminder. Now, for a very small pilot, 7% leads to quite small numbers, but if you scale that up, as we have done this month across all of the courts of Scotland and all of the um, Sheriff Court summary trials, then our assessment of that is that that gives real potential to improve the way the efficiency of the courts and improve the service that's offered to the public, because by doing that, you reduce churn. There are other issues that we're working very closely with on others to reduce churn. Um, other issues such as the use of um, CCTV links f uh, for witnesses to give their evidence in court rather than coming to court. There are a, a range of issues we're working on as a, as a partner organisation to improve the quality, but also alongside court restructuring, uh, essentially build a better criminal justice system. And I'll let Mr Naysmith, you've been waiting to come in, haven't you, with regard to the justice, access to justice. And I just want to ask before we move on, are you going to ask about churn? Yes. Ah, good. Well, you can do that after Mr Naysmith. <laughs> That's what I'm well, saying. Uh, well, it is. <laughs> well, firstly, uh, I'm delighted to hear John's assurance on uh, uh, decision-making in the fiscal service with regard to access to justice, but uh, I was going to actually address churn, and both John and Susan have mentioned churn. I think the point made by Susan about uh, the impact on, on witnesses and victims of changes in the court system is an important one, 
and one to which weight should be attached. Uh, in our uh, written submissions, the Law Society has identified the, the, uh, the, what we see as little correlation between court reforms, which in principle uh, seem inevitable, and there are very good proposals, and budgetary reforms, which seem to be uh, not associated directly with the court reforms. One aspect is churn, and uh, uh, it seems to be somewhat ambitiously assumed that uh, uh, reforms to the court uh, uh, procedures uh, will uh, uh, positively affect churn, which I'm sure it may well do, but I also believe that uh, court closures will negatively affect churn. And one aspect of churn might be, of course, Susan's point of witnesses and people intimidated by the prospect of travel not turning up in court. It's not just the accused not turning up in a criminal process. It affects the whole system of justice. And uh, uh, travel considerations are an important <coughs> aspect of that. And uh, weight should be given to that in considering the budgetary uh, implications. For example, Susan also mentioned uh, Rothsey Sheriff Court, undoubtedly a low volume court, but in reality it's simply a building. Uh, it's 6,000 a year costs identified in the Scottish Court Service budget seems to me to be, to use a euphemism, petrol money to get the court officials down there when it sits. The cost of uh, not, for example, closing that court may have some positive impact for victims, and the overall budget is negligible. It's a de minimis saving. I'm thinking in the context of my own business, when considering it in the context of the Scottish Government's budget, it's akin to me not buying a coffee on expenditure in a year. It's You're utterly not negative. Aussie solicitor, are you? <laughs> I'm not, no. Good, I just thought I'd help you out there in case of a special I, I know what it is, but I mean, it is negligible. The <laughs> Rossi will be pleased to know that. <laughs> the saving is inconsequential. Right, thank you. And uh, yes, Mr. McQueen, Anna, you're going to have your supplement because I know you've got to. Yeah, there was, there was just a thing. there was just a couple of points I wanted to mention. Firstly, just I mean just on, on, on Stuart's comment there about the savings in places like Rothsey. Um, I mean, I think they've came into our proposals because this has not just been about actually driving down costs and saving money. This has actually been mm -hmm. the first time we've had a fresh look at the whole coastal of state across the country and try to identify well what is a sensible model. And if you were starting from afresh and you didn't have a court state at the moment, would you have a court on, on Rothsey? Would you have a court on Arran? What rural areas would you actually base your courts on? So it's not just about doing this from a saving money point of view, but actually where is it sensible to hold courts and what frequency should those court hearings take place? And that's why things like Rothsey and Peebles came onto that radar in terms of the consultation. The point I did want to go back to was about the impact on, on court users, and very much, I think, echo the points that were made by, by Susan Stewart um, particularly in relation to victims and witnesses, but also the, the wider grouping of court users. The one thing we do need to bear in mind is that this, this is not all negative news and this is not all a bad impact on court users. Um, if we look at what I think has been one of our most controversial proposals in terms of the closure of Harrington, um, Harrington's and East Lothian, yeah, uh, amongst others, yeah. But Harrington... I mean, before we go any further, <laughs> we could list them off so could, nobody feels have missed out. Um, I mean, Harrington's a good example of a court which is situated within East Lothian, um, population of over 100,000, and for the eight or 10,000 residents of Harrington in the surrounding area, then clearly coming to Edinburgh would be an additional journey, and it would be additional costs, and we've made that very clear in the consultation report. For the residents of Musselburgh, of Preston Pans, um, of Trenen, of North Berwick, of Dunbar, because of access and train links to some of those areas, the travel distances are either the same or less, and in some cases the travel costs are actually less. So this is not all about a one-way traffic and something that's going to be worse for court users. For the residents of all of those areas, there are better and more regular transport links to Edinburgh. So the chances of actually being on the same bus or the same train or the same carriage um, it's probably going to be less in the future than it would have been going to Harrington where it's less. So it's it's just trying to keep this in some sort of proportion that, yes, there will be impacts on certain people in certain areas, and we fully understand that. We have he understands that. that but, uh, the, yes, I'll take Mr Logan. I want to take Alison McInnes before... Yes. Yeah, thank you. Now, just a final point in relation to court users, and it's to echo um, some work that was done when there was the change from district courts to justice of the peace courts, and there was a rationalisation of the district courts one of the important bits of work that was done at the time was an actual analysis of the individual courts of the type of cases and where witnesses came from and where witnesses 
where accused come from, and that's uh, a piece of work which we will engage with in the court service as we go through this once th th there is greater clarity on, on the particular courts which are to be affected. So, for example, you may find a court which has a particular volume of work, but it's not necessarily the case that a significant proportion of that work involves local people. There may, for example, be courts and uh, which deal with, for example, a lot of road traffic work where um, the accused uh, are uh, people who have no connection to the local area. So there are a number of factors in relation to court users which we need to factor into this, and we will certainly, it's the intention of the fiscal service to work as closely as possible with the court service in the same way that we did when we looked at the question of district courts. Thank you. Can I take Alison just now, please? Uh, thank you. I'll be brief because I do have to go to um, the Health Committee and lay some amendments. I'll be as quick as I can. Um, Mr Naismith raised the concerns um, and anticipated my question, but I would like to hear from the other panels a little bit more about churn. I mean, we know that the exceptional costs are, are, are um, associated with churn in, in the court system. Uh, we saw it in the Audit Scotland report earlier um, this year. Um, so. Do these planned budget cuts really jeopardise the attempts to reduce that? And, and ought we to be much more careful about, about that? Yeah. I mean, we, we don't believe they, they will be, and we believe that it will be manageable. Um, over the last number of years, I think we have managed to stabilise performance in, in the courts, despite the fact that we have had reducing resources. Um, when we start to look at the implications of the, the court closures and start to amalgamate business in new courts, we have looked very, very carefully at the impact on the court programme, at the volume of cases coming through, and what that would take, what we describe as the utilisation levels of courts to warrant. So even based on the planned business of the amalgamations, in most cases we reckon that court utilisation will be largely between about 85 and 90 per cent. So we still have flexibility within the programme. Um, even of those courts that proceed, the average length of a sitting day is still somewhere between three and four hours where actually we have the potential to use that court for a whole six hours in each day. So while there will always be pressures on court programming and pressures on performance, we think that the capacity is comfortably there within the estate. And I think it's taken forward the types of things that John was talking about in relation to the Making Justice Work programme now, about actually how we make the progress of cases much smoother and much faster and take out some of that churn that actually causes a lot of difficulties within the criminal justice system particularly. Mr. Carney, you want to come back? I want to be brief on churn. I think I don't know many times it's going to appear in the official report, <laughs> but you know, I think we're pretty well aired it. But please, yes. Okay, um, I'll be as brief brief as I can on on churn. Churn is a big problem within the, the court service, but the court service and the fiscal service and other uh, justice uh, partners and agencies have been doing quite a lot to try and uh, minimise the the impact of churn. One of the, the things that was tried and is going to be tried again is the introduction of a, a system model whereby it's going to programme the business so that there'll be a, a, a finite number of cases for certain slots and the business will fit into those slots. It doesn't always work like that within the justice system. And when it was tried before, it has failed. Now, that's not to say that the new uh, pilot will fail. And I think it's something that has to be addressed for the quality of service, for the delivery of justice uh, in Scotland. But there are other factors that come into churn. And for example, it's the, the working of the legislation itself in terms of intermediate diets. Intermediate diets are not working the way that it should. If the intermediate diet legislation was worked the way it should be in court, then churn might be reduced. The final thing I would like to say on that, in terms of uh, solemn business, in terms of churn, there are courts uh, around Scotland that are having difficulty in processing their solemn business. And for example, one of the, the courts that has been earmarked for closure, Stonehaven, regularly takes sheriff and jury business from Aberdeen. And indeed, as far as I believe, from January uh, 13 onwards, there's going to be week-long sittings in Stonehaven, I think principally to take overspill sheriff and jury cases from Aberdeen. I think these are useful submissions in the consultation about sheriff court closures. You've put it on the record. I want to move on as we're churning churn now, I think. Thank you very much, yes. I've now got Colin Keir, Graham Pearson, John Finney and Rod Campbell. That's uh, Colin, at last. <laughs> Your big moment. Well, there we are. Thank, <laughs> thank you, convener, and good morning. Um, 
Given, as has been said previously, the, um, the, the pressures on budgets coming from everywhere, every subject committee is going to be looking at the, at the problems of budgets. Given the uh, court reforms and the various other things that you're talking about today, have any of you actually looked at um, any options which might be considered as against what is being proposed? Options as opposed to, to, what, to what we are really talking about here, given the fact that we have to accept that there are budget pressures. Yeah. I, have, I, have there been any other options put forward? I mean, what, what we have considered, um, as I tried to outline at the very start, is what we would see as being um, options that weren't in the best interest of justice. Um, and that would really be about actually how we try to reduce our fixed case, our fixed um, cost base further by reducing staff further, by reducing sitting days further with a detrimental impact on the justice system. We have very little options that are available to us within the court service um, just because we have such a high fixed cost base. And unless we can do something dramatic in terms of our court structure that's going to allow us to release cash and to actually target investment properly in the future, then the options that we're looking at are not ones that we think would be in the, the best interest of the, of the court service or the wider justice system. What about using other buildings? What about using other buildings in communities yeah, where I mean, the sheriff court, uh, you know, yeah. I mean, part, part, getting rid of your yeah. buildings that I mean, part, part are not fit for purpose and yeah. having a court sitting somewhere else doesn't have to be in a purpose-built sheriff court building, be a purpose-built building that has disabled access, a community centre, you know, has that ever been considered? It, it has, um, and, and I think there needs to be quite a strong differentiation between civil business and criminal business. Yes. Um, with civil business, which is a account probably for about 20% of our business, it could be possible and it could be feasible um, that in the future some of that business could be done from different locations. Um, and that might have some of the advantages that Stuart was talking about earlier um, in terms of having a different segmentation for that business. The difficulty we have is that criminal business is the predominant business that goes through the courts. And criminal business does require a very high level of safety and security for all the types of issues um, that Susan outlined earlier in relation to, to victims and witnesses. So taking criminal business into community-type areas um, is, is fraught with problems, to be quite honest. I accept the distinction, but it would be possible at least to even consider civil business, perhaps, certain civil business being heard in other, other locations it's, in a community. It's not something that would be unreasonable at all. Mr Naismith. Yeah, uh, uh, that's a very... Well, my point, Colin, about alternatives. We do see alternatives, uh, and uh, particularly, actually, uh, in civil business. Uh, uh, we see uh, uh, there is identification in the, uh, the <coughs> Scottish Courts consultation document about reforms and reference to other reforms of civil procedure and evidence that are ongoing. There is scope. There must be scope for reforms there. For example, employment tribunals, you can book a case online. Uh, in the, there is, we see no reason why you have to go to the sheriff court to get a warrant on a summary cause. You should be able to do it online, even although it involves payment of a fee. And uh, there is no reason for routine civil procedural matters to be considered anywhere locally. It can be done centrally. There's no reason for interlocutors to be typed at the court. They can be typed centrally. Now, these involve, of course, reforms to infrastructure and reforms to procedure, which in fairness to the Scottish Court Service, I believe, are under consideration. And it strikes us that there are obvious opportunities for significant savings by moving these matters forward. Of course, in a budgetary context where capital expenditure is slashed, uh, such reforms become difficult. And that's where the Scottish Government, the Scottish Court Service, Everyone who's a participant here finds himself between a rock and a hard place. But we've certainly identified those as areas for significant savings, we believe. Uh, also, uh, uh, where Eric says 20% of the court business is civil business. I also believe that of that civil business, 90% of it is undefended. So we're talking about a pure administrative process that must be, surely in this day and age, conducive to savings on an economies of scale basis and information technology basis. Colin, do you want to come in for it? Yeah. Uh, one of the things, if I go to Mr Queen, is for instance family business, family law, which would involve maybe social workers, local people yeah. being involved in it. Is that not a type of business or even some 
uh, small claims and things like this, which are usually locally uh, well, focused. It, are they not things that could perhaps be held in a different venue? Very much so. Accepting procedural matters can be centralised? Very, I accept that entirely. We, I, I believe that's true. Uh, and, and there is a, a, a strong body that says that children shouldn't be anywhere near a court full stop. There are other venues for this to take place. Such a, such a, 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 a procedural method involves the arbiter, be it a sheriff or be it devolved to other persons, moving from the court. And uh, I understand there's some resistance to the prospect of mobile sheriffs. Uh, I, I honestly don't see any reason why that should be so. The cost is uh, nothing. Give them more wheels there. I don't yeah. know why. Uh, Skateboarding sheriffs. Yeah. Well, <laughs> very we, we're talking image. about meeting at a venue for family law, uh, yeah. which need not necessarily be the court. Uh, that could be managed, I dare say. Alternative. Who did I have next? I had Mr. Carroll. Thanks. And then I'm coming on to uh, Graham Pearson and John Finney and Rod after the two witnesses. Uh, I, think, Carroll. I think PCS would uh, say that. Uh, options are limited in terms of delivering justice in a significantly different way and uh, from what we have at the moment. From the dialogue events, though, um, what has been suggested about using alternative accommodation for certain uh, types of business was suggested at the, the dialogue events. And that was something which, again, I don't think has come through particularly well in the, in the consultation. In terms of doing things online, that's fine as far as it goes. And like direct measures, there is a place for it. Um, but certainly PCS uh, would be putting over that when people are dealing with, for example, family bereavements or adoption cases um, or summary causes, for example, uh, in small claims, that one-to-one -one interaction between the, the, the member of the public who are wanting to deal with uh, those particular types of business and the member of staff at the front line who can give that uh, expert professional advice, giving empathy and sympathy to the, the person if that is, is required, is something which should also be uh, considered in paramount in this and shouldn't really be a, a consideration for a budget cuts, especially when you're dealing with the, t the type of business that I've dis described in terms of adoption and a bereavement and dealing with small estates and large estates. And then putting the burden of that onto the person having to travel further, further anxiety, further concern and worry for the person in that position. Thank you, Mr McQueen. I just want to say very quickly, just on the, on the question about choices, um, I mean, as far as we're concerned, it's not a choice about court structures or transformation, it's actually a choice about them both. Um, and we see both things being taken forward. Lord Gill's review of civil courts will be the biggest change that we will see to the way that civil business has been done. The whole emphasis is on is about actually using technology to its maximum effect, making sure that there's electronic registration of cases, and trying to limit as far as possible the need to come to court. So we, we don't see it as being a choice between one or the other, but actually trying to find a place that they're both complementary. I'll take um, Graham. P Sorry, finished. Yeah, Graham, uh, followed by John and Rod. Graham. Thanks, convener. If, if I can speak to Ms. Gallagher, uh, returning to the victims and um, witness issues again. Um, we've heard a lot from the various panelists about the dialogues, um, and I wanted to ask you two questions. One, do you feel that uh, victim support uh, participated in the dialogues and your views were heard and fully considered? And then the second one was more in, in connection with the, your submission, um, trying to give me some understanding of, of the challenges you face. Having JP trial witnesses present in the same building as witnesses in sheriff court trials will bring significant challenges to our witness services. So can you tell me, do you feel that your voice has been heard within the dialogues considered and acted on? And secondly, can you tell us what these challenges are that you mentioned in your evidence? Absolutely. In relation to the first point, I mean, Victim Support and Scottish Court Service have been in dialogue for some time about trying to improve the experience for witnesses in courts uh, across Scotland, and we've been doing quite a bit of work to try and do that. 
Um, so, and I think that that is a really positive move that, that has happened. Um, we have been out when Scottish courts did their regional uh, sessions around the country. Our staff actually went to those sessions and did participate uh, in them. So we do feel that there is a contribution to that to be made uh, and was heard at that moment in time. My issue, though, about that is about victims and witnesses themselves, not just through an agency like Victim Support and how the general public have been informed and involved potentially moving forward in relation to these dialogue. And I know that people can contribute to the consultation, but maybe there was an opportunity to do a little bit more locally to engender other people's views um, about how it will affect them potentially. So that was the first point. The second point in relation to JP is a very interesting one in that when the witness service was set up, it was set up to work with people involved in criminal trials, but not in JP courts. So what we have found is that over the years, we have subsequently been supporting people um, as a byproduct uh, of our work, because we can't differentiate between uh, who is actually going to a JP court and who is going to other courts when everybody's sitting in the same room and is in a witness um, uh, courtroom. And we don't want to go up to people and say, yeah, we can support you, but we can't support you today kind of issue. So the impact on our organisation we're still looking at. We're not sure whether it will be great, but we do know that our, vol our volume of work for our witness service may possibly increase because of these changes. Okay, thanks for that. And a point for, for Mr McQueen, um, which is probably a, a, a personal bet, bet noir for me. It's very frustrating on this side of the, the table to listen to the challenges that you face in terms of budget and plans for the future and the cuts that you all face. Um, in the light of the fact that money has been invested in prisons and courts to allow uh, court appearances to be utilised through closed-circuit television, but yet there's little evidence that it's used. And it seems to me there is very substantial savings to be made uh, in terms of money, court time, and, and the impact on the environment even. Is there any energy in the system to finally get this thing working? Um, I think there is energy, and, and hopefully you'll start to see some of that soon. Um, one of the major parts of making justice work um, is a specific project looking at video conferencing, which has been led by the Legal Aid Board. And the first part of that is about establishing um, agent to client access between solicitor's offices and prisons and police stations to allow discussions to take place with their clients. So that's that's the first phase that's moving forward. There has been a link, I think it's probably the link you're alluding to in Berlin, um, between Berlin and Glasgow Sheriff Court for some time now um, for full committal hearings and solemn business. And its use has been sporadic, I think, to say best. Um, there has been quite a a resurgence of use in that since the earlier part of this year, and about 40% of field committal hearings are now taking place by video conferencing. So one of the things that we will be looking at is where can we sensibly make targeted use of video conferencing in the future to get the best uptake of business. Now, quite clearly, we can't use it for all business, and it's not, maybe not sensible to use it all across the country. There are limitations in terms of access to prisons and how many booths they would have to make available. So what we are trying to look at is actually well, where's the best areas where you would get the biggest effect. So how many procedural hearings are we moving people around the country where we could try to achieve that by video conferencing? And there is strong commitment between certainly the prisons and, and prison service to try to expand that where we can. Um, two weeks ago, we done the first trial um, of a criminal appeal in Parliament <laughs> House by video conferencing. Um, so we see that as being an area now we now want to develop and try to make sure we take the majority of criminal appeals where people are in custody by video conferencing. Um, the judges in the High Court are keen to see if there's other areas that that can be extended to, again, focusing on people where they are, they are actually in custody. So it's something that we are moving forward. There is momentum now. Um, but I think equally, I realism that it's not a silver bullet, but something that could be very helpful in terms of dealing with certain segments of people that are required to come to court where video conferencing could be an option for them. I, I can assure you I'll keep an eye on these developments. No, absolutely. Oh, he and, will too. He the, will too. The one thing I would say on that is that there is also a big commitment actually about the cost and savings for it. Because I think what everyone realises is that the cost savings would not fall to the court service, but they may fall to other organisations. So there's a commitment about trying to pool money from either the savings to make sure that we can cover the costs for investment that might be required in the future. Yeah, we're back to this business of, you know, 
uh, Peter and Paul and, and seeing it all as a, as a huge, yeah. you're all in, we're all in it together yeah. kind of yeah. a thing. And yes. I think that is the big difference that we've seen yes. this year in yes. terms of the approach to planning. It is much more shared and about understanding yeah. the cost of the savings and where they fall. John Finney followed with Rod Campbell, please. Yeah, thank you, Convener. Uh, my question is about the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service written submission. It's for Mr Logue. Um, and it's about, uh, Mr Logue, about consolidating the sheriff and jury business. Now, we heard earlier from Ms Gallagher about the issues of residents in Rothsey requiring to travel to Greenock and the challenges of transport associated with that. Representing the Highlands and Islands, clearly I can out-trump that in significantly in terms of mileage and the, the, the inconvenience. Um, in your, on page two of your submission, you say the two most significant issues in respect of court restructuring from the Crown Office Public Fiscal Service perspective was adequate capacity and, secondly, that there is not excessive travelling for both police and civilian witnesses. You then go on to say none of the distances from existing courts to the proposed centres are prohibitive. Now, as things stand at the moment, someone in the North Coast or uh, Thurzell would go to Wick. They would require to go to um, Inverness. I, I understand there may be some provision for transitional arrangements. Um, someone, for instance, in Tyree, uh, who would previously go to Oban, would require to go to Dumbarton, as I understand. Your microphone's on. Is the microphone on? Yes. Oh, right. Okay, I'll lean towards it, convener. Sorry. Um, the um, someone, for instance, in Tyree would require to go to Dumbarton. Uh, is it? You, you further go on to say that um, you're conducting detailed analysis of the postcodes of civilian witnesses compared with their location. Um, do, is it? Am I to tell my constituents that none of these distances are prohibitive? Is it, would that be the position of the Crown Office, Property for Fiscal Service? Uh, can you give us some further information on the analysis? Inevitably, that's going to result in additional overnight um, expenditure and the carbon footprint. Now, not perhaps within your submission, but similarly, the same applies to the high court circuit and the removal of Inverness from that, when, for what people would perceive as a few carloads of lawyers coming up to a few busloads of witnesses going down, with all the uncertainty associated with that. So can you comment on where we are with this analysis, please? The analysis is the work I referred to earlier when I was drawing the comparison between the move from district courts to justice of the peace courts. It's, it's that bit of work about really breaking down from the information that we have about the people who use the criminal courts, where they live, and also the frequency with which they're asked to go to court. And I appreciate there's a, a, a reluctance on the part of the committee to... Um, perpetuate the use of the word churn, but a large part of the, the, the problem that we face at the moment is the, the, the repeated attendance by people at courts, um, whether they be more local or, or further afield. So that work is ongoing at the moment. I don't have the, the detailed results of that yet that I can share with the committee, but we're still at the stage of um, working that through ourselves and then ultimately sharing it with the court service. But I, you know, I would be very happy to share that information with the the committee in due course, I would imagine in the same way that uh, previous committees of previous parliaments considered the pre precise proposals for each court, um, that that information would ultimately find its way before um, this committee if it comes to consider any of the, the precise proposals for individual courts. Thank you. And Rod Campbell, please. I have got a few questions. Firstly, one question I should have asked I earlier. could tell that from all the papers you have been exactly. rattling. Um, one question I should have asked earlier on is, what, um, Mr McQueen, is the estimated backlog of maintenance costs for the whole of uh, the Scottish Courts Estates? What's the total figure? Um, that's a good question. I think the total figure is somewhere in the region of around £60 million. Now, I'm not 100% sure, so if the committee would like me to confirm yeah, that formally. Don't commit yourself yeah, to something if you're not sure. Uh, yeah, so what to do is to write to the committee mm -hmm. when you've got the figures. That would be the better way forward. Yes. Okay. Uh, and uh, over what period of time would uh, kind of these maintenance costs normally be incurred? I mean, um, what's the time scale if, if you were for actually uh, carrying out work? Um, it probably over a time scale largely of anywhere between zero and five years. I mean, each of these are, are, are prioritised. Um, in terms of their importance for compliance, for health and safety, for desirability. So it would be over a period of time. Um, in relation to Lord Gill's report, 
Lord Gill obviously highlighted a great number of things, including what he called the increased role of the district judge, as he put it. I think we're now talking about summary sheriffs mm -hmm. dealing with small claims. I didn't detect in the Gill review per se anything that specifically dealt with the, the locations of district judges uh, and issues such as the conveners touched on in terms of mobility. Um, your proposals effectively reduce the number of locations uh, where district judges will be sitting. It doesn't really flow from Lord Gill's report, does it? Um, it, it, it doesn't flow directly, but what we have tried to do is to make sure that in terms of the proposal we've taken forward, they take account for that as far as we can. Um, and quite clearly, these are proposals that have been signed off by the SES board as proposals that are now ready for consultation, and, and Lord Gill, as Lord President, now chairs the SES board. So we have tried to reflect as much as we can the emerging ideas from the reforms within our indications for court structures. Okay, thanks. Um, and just a small question, I think primarily aimed at uh, uh, Mr Logie. In terms of, just to assist my understanding of how the new federation system operates, North, East and West, uh, are there any difficulties if you have uh, a High Court case, for example, which would be proceeding in the Eastern region, whereas uh, if it's a solemn or summary case, it would be proceeding in another region in terms of kind of organisation in the fiscal and crown surface generally? Uh, I'm not sure that I quite... Uh, well, perhaps it might help you to explain kind of the, how this, the federation system operates in practice. Yes, certainly. In practice, um, all summary cases and all solemn cases in the Sheriff Court take place within each of the three federations. So if I speak in relation to my own federation, my own responsibility, which is for the east of Scotland, if I, I think the best way to illustrate that part of the country is by reference to the current police forces that it relates to. So it matches to Lothian and Borders Police, Fife Police and Central Scotland Police. So all of the summary cases that I have responsibility for in the east of Scotland and all of the indictment solemn cases in the Sheriff Court in the east of Scotland take place within the courts and there are 13 of them. Uh, within the east of Scotland, and I have responsibility for 11 procurator's fiscal offices. So we have a network of sheriff courts, JP courts, and procurator's fiscal offices all within the east of Scotland, and they have, they take care of all of the summary and sheriff court and solemn business. Any solemn business in the high court, which um, originates from anywhere in the east of Scotland, uh, can be prosecuted at the moment, anywhere that the High Court sits in Scotland, and it is the High Court's responsibility to allocate cases at the stage of trial, and they do that according to um, the availability on a nationwide basis. So it is possible, I can think in the last year, for example, um, that there was a murder case from the, which the, where the offence took place in the borders, where the matter went to trial in Dundee. And so at the moment, there is a degree of, of movement of uh, high court casework across the country. Um, the proposals in the uh, consultation document at the moment envisage that with the high court working towards um, a more stable picture of three centres, one in the east, one in the north and one in the west, it should be possible to change the way in which that, that, that work is programmed and organised so that in the majority of cases they can take place at the local High Court base, and for the east of Scotland that would be Edinburgh. But I think it's always envisaged that there would need to be a degree of flexibility because of the very tight um, time limits uh, in custody cases in the High Court. It may still need to be the case that uh, you, you take advantage of the flexibility on a national basis. Does that...? I'm, I'm, no, exactly. I'm, I'm sorry if I've technical, but missed the point. If, if, for example, in my uh, constituency in North East Fife, a High Court case would go to Edinburgh or, and or possibly Dunfermline in some circumstances. But um, the summary cases in the future under proposals, we're going to Dundee, which is in the northern region, that's right. Yes, I see the point. Um, yeah. High Court cases at the moment from Fife may, as I hope I've illustrated, end up being prosecuted in the High Court in Glasgow because it's the biggest High Court facility and therefore it has the majority of the High Court business. It takes High Court cases from across the whole of... Scotland, and I'm aware of cases um, which have originated in Fife and which have gone to trial in Glasgow. The proposal in the restructuring document for the work at Cooper Sheriff Court, if Cooper Sheriff Court closes, is that it will transfer to Dundee because that 
in terms of the work that the Scottish Court Service have done would appear to provide the best the best fit, if you like, for the, the, the work and the people who use Cooper Sheriff Court. Um, the fact that it moves from the east to the north in terms of COPFS is of, of little consequence. We will organise ourselves around that and it makes no difference to our work. So I'm sorry if that's a very long-winded... A wee bit of a technical question. Thank you for your answer. Yeah. I'm just going to, I'm going to conclude short, but I just wondered if you would possibly answer this. I mean, it seems to me we've got Lord Gill's review going on, we've got Lord Cadloway doing something, we've got Mr Logue, you tell us that the Crown Office is looking at a review of the kind of business that the various courts do. Should we not be deferring anything about the share of courts, touching where our share of courts are, until these all come together? Or should we just press on? I mean, these other things will have impact. So just briefly, either a yes or no, or do we have to just get on with this, uh, or should we wait? I can certainly, from my, from my own perspective, um, say that I don't see any need to wait. These are all matters that are all essentially brought together by the work that we're doing with the Scottish Court Service, with the Scottish Government. So from the perspective of the Fiscal Service, uh, we no, they're all, we're taking them all together in the round. Mr. McQueen. I, I would be entirely with John. I mean, I think we'd be putting our head in the sand if we if we didn't take this forward. The, these are being brought together within the Scottish Government's Making Justice Work Programme. So there is a, an overarching programme that is looking at all the reforms that are coming, all the technological developments and where court structures fits as a part of that. And I think what will start to emerge is something that is looking much more joined up in terms of timescales and outcomes and deliverables from those different programmes. I'll give the other witnesses an opportunity if they wish to just a brief comment, wait or, no, or go we ahead. Say wait. We, would, we would prefer reform to be fact-based, we're not against reform, but uh, there are other reviews in the pipeline and we see court closures as not related to reform. Thank you. Mr Carroll? Yeah. The, review, the reviews that you've, you've mentioned are not simply about a redistribution of existing business, but the way in which cases that need to come before the courts are dealt with. It's our view that the changes need to be brought about by the reviews mentioned are significant in terms of root and branch reform of the judicial system in Scotland, and the present consultation does not put in place any revised re or reform structure for future reforms, nor does it change how any of the court work is processed. Thank you. Ms Gallagher? Um, we would actually say wait as well until we actually decide what, how we're going to move forward justice in this country. Thank you very much. I'm going to uh, cease there. It was a long session. Thank you very much for your evidence. And I'm going to suspend, and I was going to give you till midday, but that gives you 14 minutes break. Should I do it? Oh, yes. We'll, we'll rise. We'll start again at midday. That gives you a proper break. You've earned it. So suspend. 14 minutes.
Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's us back again. And I welcome our second panel of witnesses uh, to the meeting uh, discussing the implications of the budget. Sean McKendrick, Vice Convener, Criminal Justice Standing Committee, Association of Directors of Social Work. Kate Donaghan, <coughs> Governor of Court and Vale, Brigadier Human Rule. Uh, Her Majesty's Chief Inspector of Prisons for Scotland, Colin McConnell, Chief Executive Scottish Prison Service, and Anne Pinkman, Convener, Scottish Working Group on Women's Offending. Can I thank you again for written submissions? They were all very helpful. And the focus in this session, although there's nothing to stop you commenting if you wish on the other session, but basically it is with regard to the women offending, the financing of the Commission on Women's Offending. And I also thank the Cabinet Secretary, who has made a very, very full answer from him as well, dealing with many of the points. Right, um, questions, please. Graham Pearson. Good morning, panel, and uh, thanks for waiting for us. Um, I think one of the, um, the pieces of evidence that we received uh, from the Chief Inspector uh, of Prisons indicated that as much as he welcomed the £20 million of capital funding, uh, he invited bold decisions. Now, given the amount of time that the committee has spent looking at this situation, would you like to share with us the kind of bold decisions that you would invite for the future? It should come on automatically. Yes, thank you. Uh, I, I'm, thank you very much indeed for that. I, I, um I think it is a moment for, for bill uh, decisions, mainly because, as I've said in my submission, that we've been waiting a long time for a bill decision to come along. I've been hoping for Cornton Vale specifically uh, to become top of the priority list, um, and I feel very strongly that it should do so. I think where I feel much more hopeful, as I said also in my submission, that I feel there is a, a now a, a much more uh, optimistic uh, uh, situation um, both in terms of the way the new chief executive is looking at things, his own uh, take on personal responsibility and the responsibility of the board for the future, uh, and also the appointment of Kate Donegan as uh, uh, the new governor at Court and Vale. So I'm feeling much more optimistic than I was. But to answer your question, yes, I think we need to look at um, new ways of uh, and new places to imprison women, uh, new ways of imprisoning women, new ways of dealing with them, uh, in a much more holistic fashion, not as a silo within a criminal justice system, but very much part of a, 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 a much more horizontal approach, if you like, to how we, uh, how we deal with, with female offenders. Uh, and I think that some of the ideas that I, I see uh, coming down the track may well tick some of those boxes, but I do think we need to see precisely uh, what that vision is going to look like. Uh, how are we going to deal with women offenders? Uh, how are we going to deal with them in the whole process? Uh, and also how are we going to deal with um, some of the family uh, uh, issues, which we might come on to later. But I see very much uh, many, many mothers are imprisoned at the moment. How on earth are we going to deal with that situation? So I, I do see a, a, a bold decisions in terms of uh, location and, and, and uh, perhaps a new prison, but also in the whole way we look at imprisoning uh, women and dealing with women offenders uh, in its widest, widest sense. I don't know if that answers your question. Well, yes. Would you care to comment on uh, on the the, the um, answer that the cabinet secretary gave us? Uh, I think you have the opportunity to see it on his proposals and way forward. I haven't actually. You read haven't. It. You haven't had the chance. No, I haven't had a chance. Um, ah, which is maybe um, my fault, and I apologise. Uh, no, no, no. It's not at all. I'll make sure you have a copy um, as we proceed, because there's a whole list of proposals here from the cabinet secretary. Some of them, I think, addressing some of your um, appropriate concerns that we've shared for a long time. Um, yes. Uh, well, uh, Maybe you could welcome Kate Donegan back to yes, the prison indeed. that she's, she's looked we go after back. previously. We go back, actually, yeah. back to, I think, year 2000, and we're both wearing well. Yeah. But, <laughs> given the fact that so much time has been spent talking about what we might do, returning to the prison, what's your own view as you look at the current prison compared to where it's come from, and where would you like to take it to over the next five years given the support and authority? I think what I notice, first of all, is that the condition of the women hasn't, hasn't varied, sadly, um, since I was there last time round. There's still a lot of 
um, women suffering from mental health issues, and that's something I've already picked up in the first month of being. I've contacted, or being in Contonville, I've contacted the uh, Mental Welfare Commission and also Scottish Government in relation to some of the women who are really in quite distressing conditions because of mental health issues. So the, the nature of the population hasn't changed that much. But I must say, in, in going back, because of the fact that the new chief executive has taken a very personal interest in Cornton Vale, and because Dame Eilish's report has come out, probably at a time where lots of organisations are, are coming together in a collaborative way to deal with women offenders, getting back to Cornton Vale at this stage is incredibly exciting because it gives us the opportunity to work in the kind of integrated way that the Chief Inspector has been talking about. And there is now a real passion amongst third sector and statutory bodies to do exactly that. Whereas I guess the last time I was there, I felt pretty much like a, a lone voice. I would get on my box and wave my arms around, but not to tremendous effect. I think the difference now is that all parties are really um, working together and very keen um, to give life to, to Dame Eilish's recommendations. That's a wonderful opportunity. Just... Say for clarification, I wasn't aware the Cabinet Secretary's letter in response was only only came out yesterday, and you will it, it, you probably will want to do supplementary <coughs> written to us once you've got the opportunity after this mm. uh, meeting to comment on that because we can't possibly ask you to read it thoroughly just now and comment on it. Uh, but there are many issues touched in there that I feel you're going to uh, uh, come forward. I'm, I'm getting your copies just now, but I wouldn't expect you to comment on the spot. Uh, on it. Any else want to comment in particular on that question from Graham Pearson? Right, could can I, I ask? Yes, of ones. course, Graham. Go Given that health and health issues play such a big part in, in dealing with people who are essentially damaged, the shift of health responsibility from SPS to NHS provision, will that bring any immediate benefits that you're aware of? Does that open up? a bigger resource that will support women? Or? Yes, it does. Um, it was quite a complex exercise to make the transition between SBS healthcare responsibility and NHS, but it does exactly what you've suggested. It opens up the whole of the NHS um, to provide care for women. And I think that the good bit about that transition process, although there were some difficulties in terms of restructuring, there wasn't any difference um, from the prisoner's perspective in, in terms of the care they received. But it does give me um, an opportunity to, to, to link into um, the, rather than just the local health board, all NHS health boards, because of course Corton Vale is a national establishment. So from my point of view, particularly again for women with mental health difficulties in particular, it opens up a range of options that were much more difficult to, um, um, to hook into before. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I now have Colin Keir followed by Sandra White. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if there had been any discussion uh, with regards to the, the benefit changes that are about to happen over the next uh, number of months and if the changes disproportionately affect women um, and perhaps it's been discussed. It's certainly not a... Oh, sorry, thank you, Kadir. It's not a discussion that uh, we've entered into at this stage in terms of the, the grand plan for, for taking this forward, but I take your point. Uh, there may well be uh, disbenefits in those uh, arrangements as they're brought forward, but perhaps Kate could sit, mention something more locally. Yeah, we're, we're actually in discussion now uh, with DWP to see what the effect is going to, to be on women because um, loss of housing allowance and difficulty with maintaining tenancies and, and getting anything better than a temporary accommodation for women at least is very important. So we are in discussion now about precisely how, how the change in the benefit system is going to affect female offenders and what we might be able to do to influence um, some of the difficulties that they have. But we do have surgeries in the prison to help women with benefit problems. But we're dealing, we're, we're lazing the Scottish Government particularly. It was really in terms of uh, actually an ongoing discussion I had yesterday at the City of Edinburgh Council who are considering the, their position with regards to benefits and particularly the benefits to single households to one person 
and how, you know, generally speaking, it may well be the, the male partner who is in receipt of uh, these benefits. And given the possible problems that were identified of people getting the, the payments and essentially blowing them, if there was something somewhere that could be articulated uh, through the report to say that this uh, is being looked at, Yes, well, it, it certainly is, uh, because we share the same concerns. One of the principal difficulties, among others, for women who are released from prison is this whole business of, of needing to have secure accommodation, and that doesn't happen for them um, as often as, as we would like. And the impact of the change in benefits could, could be fairly dramatic, so um, it's obviously something that we need to address. Yeah, to make a note more from a community-based perspective, uh, there's a clear analysis of the correlation between welfare reform and the impact that will have on uh, the country's most poor population. And we've highlighted housing benefit as a particular issue and the uh, difficulties or the potential difficulties around the move from uh, straight to local authorities to individuals. And certainly within my own local authority of Glasgow, registered social landlords have begun to discuss with residents uh, different ways of them processing the payment to them straight directly to registered social landlords. So that's one example of this. In terms of the impact of the work programme, there will indeed be particular impacts in, in, in relation to women and, and women who offend. Uh, they are, what we know about those women who offend, the vast majority of them have a number of challenges in their lives. Being able to subscribe to the detail of work programmes may well be a challenge for them. Needless to say as well that there will also be childcare related elements to that. So it may well be fair to summarise is, is that there's an analysis and I think there is a correlation about potential impacts. Mm -hmm. But maybe the discussion has maybe not uh, progressed as yet because of the uh, detail around the impact of, of that uh, welfare reform. Yes, I now have Sandra White followed by Rod Campbell. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kavina, and uh, good afternoon. Well, it's good afternoon. It's just after twelve noon. Uh, can I just thank you all for your submission? Uh, I found them excellent. And as someone who visited Cortonville in the previous role of the Equal Opportunities Committee, uh, like yourself, I was absolutely appalled at uh, the conditions there. And uh, although there was there was help starting to come forward, it certainly wasn't joined up at the time. So I'm really very, very pleased and congratulating you on your report and the work that you're, you're actually doing at the moment. Uh, I don't particularly want to follow up on the DWP question, but as it is a budget, you know, we're looking at the draft budget, I think I have to ask you something about if you think some of this stuff in the Commission is achievable under the budget. Now, the convener mentioned the letter from the Justice Secretary, which is about six pages and excellent. And it, it does indicate that it, it accepts recommendations of the Commission in relation to community support, more community justice centres, uh, reintegration, etc. I just would ask you perhaps an, an honest question. Do you think under the current financial settlement and the budget, if all of these areas are achievable? Well, that's how I'm Everybody, who's wanting to pitch in <laughs> human role? I have nothing to do with money, thank goodness. Um, <laughs> uh, but I think, the que the, I think the question is also uh, what happens if we don't do something. Uh, we can't go on the way that has been going on for too long. Um, and um, I, I, I think that that's, that's the question, what happens if we don't do something? Uh, and if we could only wave a magic wand, and I'm hoping that ha having been given the Cabinet Secretary's uh, uh, announcement, I hope there is a magic wand in there, then I think that would be fantastic. Uh, I, when I look back on where we were in 2009 and when I first went there, I was, like you, also shocked by what I saw, obviously. Uh, and I think, uh, whilst I think um, Mrs Donegan uh, and the Chief Executive are taking due account of what's going on at the moment, I'm very pleased to hear some of the work that is going on at Cornet Vale recently. Um, we can't go on in the current state, uh, and I think we have to, as therefore, um, it doesn't answer your question, uh, your specific question about money, but I think that there is a moral question here as well. Yes, Mr. McConnell. In, in terms of corporate SPS, um, I think I'm able to say that you know, the Scottish Government has ensured that SPS is adequately funded for the job that it has. And, and certainly the proposals that 
uh, I've put the Cabinet Secretary and he's written to, the, uh, to this committee uh, about, uh, in relation to what Dame Mailish is setting out as a, a journey for us to follow, I, th I think is absolutely opposite to where you know, the Scottish Prison Service would like to see things going. In relation to the resources we have, uh, I don't foresee in the immediate future any particular uh, difficulties in, in a sense, establishing the seed corn of taking uh, Dame Eilish's uh, key recommendations forward. In fact, I've said as much uh, to the committee in, in my evidence. Of course, what happens in the next budget review will be critical uh, to that. Uh, and it will, it's not for SPS, it will be for uh, the, uh, the government and parliament more generally to make judgments about where scarce public resources uh, should go. But given what uh, the Chief Inspector and others have said, I mean, I would be really hopeful and, and encourage uh, the Scottish Government to, to support us and move ahead and deliver the wider agenda as the Mailish has set out. I've got Anne Pinkman followed by Sean McKendrick, yes. Um, I was going to make a comment, if I may, in relation to um, building on from what, what Kate said earlier. I think there is a, there is a real appetite and, and energy within partners across the, in, in the communities to, to work together, to use the existing funding that, that we already have and use that more creatively. And I made mention of that in the written submissions, such as the, the establishment of women offender teams within communities and recruit, recruitment or secondment of, of nurses from um, the NHS into criminal justice. So that I think if it, to build on, on, on that willingness to work together alongside any new monies should allow us to take forward the, the agenda and addressing the needs of women offenders, both in the prison and very much so in the community. Mr McKendrick. Well, the answer was very broadly similar to Anne's contribution. I think there is uh, one other aspect we just want to kind of take the opportunity to uh, illuminate on, and this really is about a much more collaborative uh, working uh, approach to women's offenders and we're very heartened to hear the recommendation of the community justice centres which actually does bring a focus uh, to the integration uh, suggestion that, that's around and the evidence that says that such a, a much more integrated collaborative approach to the variety of needs that women face is, is more likely to deliver as a sense of outcomes. So uh, I would broadly agree with uh, my colleague's statement around uh, the, the landscape, the environment, the current culture and recognise uh, that we are of some benefits in which to uh, make best use of the additional money, particularly the £1 million given in this year, and the change fund. So how we actually ensure that that's much more integrated delivery around a range of needs seems to me to be a very positive place to be in. Uh, fine. Margaret, you've got a supplementary there. Yes, yeah. thank you. Uh, and good afternoon to the panel. Um, just on the community justice service, and you know, I'm pleased that you are now looking at this as a collaborative um, service. Have you had any talks at all with local authorities and health services about just the best way that this could be provided? It's a difficult question for ADSW. It's a member-based organisation, so therefore different councils will be at different places in respect to the, the types and forms of dialogue that we'll be in. Certainly aware of uh, both Dundee and Fife in, in particular uh, having uh, particular responses in relation to their debates and discussions. And my own uh, local authority, our own CGA, have been asked, and uh, they will dis the, the Glasgow City Council, sorry. Uh, my own CGA will uh, consider a report from myself that will look at a partner's day that looks to deal with a number of organisational challenges around the creation of community justice centre, engage those partners in it, try to find some answers, define a common approach and get into debates with partners around uh, how we will deliver such an approach. Colleagues in Dundee City Council have a women offendance team mm -hmm. and one of the contributions that we would want to illustrate at this particular time is that whilst we recognise the collaborative approaches can lead to better outcomes, Often our experience of this has been that they are funded by Section 27, the money that comes to local authorities to uh, provide community justice resources. So in, in the cases of Dundee in particular, they fund the NHS to provide the nurse service. So when we are mentioning collaborative approaches, we need to recognise that the whole system 
requires to invest, particularly around about uh, the most vulnerable women in our society. And as yet, that discussion uh, is, is yet to be fully reached and achieved with all of the health boards and all of the councils. But I can give you some assurance that colleagues in ADSW are progressing that form of discussion. They may well be at different stages. Sorry, just to follow up on that. Is just there a time? Just to see, uh, except to follow up, just, you have the paper in front of you now with the Cabinet Secretary, which deals with that page, I have got page to it, probably eight, uh, community justice centres and pilots. If you had the opportunity to look at that. Yeah. I would have preferred that. Uh, uh, you know, I know, a great, I agree with you. <laughs> a greater time I know, to look at it. I'm not asking you to comment, <laughs> I'm just going to say it's there. Uh, yes. And it, it only came in yesterday, which is a pity, but. There yes. we are, just to point to it. Sorry, Margaret. Yeah. I'm pleased to hear that there is already some partnership work going on uh, around these community justice mm -hmm. centres and, and how they would be funded, because that was uh, a question I was going to ask as well, and I hope that there is um, partnership in that funding as well. But I just wonder where, you know, is there a time scale for this so that the whole of Scotland is participating in the partnership working? In response to the first part, there's a million pound allocated within this financial year to look at a range of recommendations, including the pilot of this. I, in terms of a timescale, it's a matter for the Scottish Government and local authorities to discuss and identify those pilot sites. I don't have a particular date in mind in relation to that, but I can uh, confirm to uh, the committee today that both ADSW and the Scottish Government are keen to ensure that that's done uh, efficaciously and as quickly as possible, but I don't have a particular time frame in mind. Yes, Kate Donahan, please. Uh, we do have examples of, of um, 218 in Glasgow and the Willow Project in Edinburgh. Uh, 218, I think, is broadly recognised as being a really excellent community facility for women. It's kind of one-stop shop, um, and many people um, praise it as, as, the, as the sort of example of, of the community hub, although it, it, the community hub, like 218 or Willow, really needs to expand to include more partners so that it's almost a one-stop shop for women, many of whom find it very difficult to navigate the complexities of, you know, of, of, of society, of, of trying to work out their benefits, who to go to for housing, what happens when children are taken away and so on. So I think these community hubs, I have great hopes for, for their success. Uh, yes. Some of the committee members went, including myself, and I think others were at 218, mm -hmm. where others went elsewhere. I'm very, very impressed with it. And I'm interested in the comments about benefits, because one of the first things we were told was that somebody turned up from 218 to give them transport and to get them benefits, and also to make sure the housing benefit continues. Simple thing like that. Mm -hmm to stabilise uh, as soon as they came out. So we were very impressed with that facility. Rod Campbell, now followed by John Finney, and then Sandra, you want him back in after after the others. Don't yeah. leap. I, I, just, I just wanted to praise the 218, but you've already yes. mentioned it, so that's No, it, we're very, very impressed with it and reported back to the rest of the committee. Rod Campbell, followed by John I, Finney. I, my question was, was largely in relation to the uh, Community Justice Service generally, but... Um, given, I mean, this is supposed to be a meeting about budgetary constraints. Mm -hmm. Given the budget available, what can be achieved in in relation to community justice and reintegration generally? Any thoughts on kind of the funding available, Mr. McConnell? From my perspective, I think there's a real opportunity here uh, for me not to simply talk about the resources that have been allocated to the SBS mm -hmm. and to think more broadly about the resources that are allocated across the justice system uh, to deliver uh, services, not, not just to women, although we are speaking particularly and rightly about women in custody or women who offend uh, this afternoon. But I think there's a real opportunity, and I, I know policy colleagues uh, within the Scottish Government are really keen to look at this, which is there's a tremendous amount of resource already allocated across the justice system. And I think the challenge to us uh, those of us who work within the justice system, is to look at how we can use that resource more flexibly, to target it differentially, in order to get the, the, the improvement and outcomes that we are looking for. So when I sit and look at these numbers for SPS moving forward, and they are substantial, I tend to look at them as a criminal justice resource, not just simply an SPS resource. And I, I would imagine other partners are beginning to do that too. Anyone else wish to comment? No? 
Yes, sorry. Um, echo the comments I made earlier. It's about ensuring that we work with other partners within the communities, such as health, which we've, met, we've mentioned already this morning. I mean, there are more peop more women subject to community-based supervision in the community than there are women in prison. Um, and those women have lead chaotic lives and they do need help to access mainstream services. It's not all about the creation of specialist services for women offenders. It is very much about access to mainstream services. And it's very reassuring that um, in the, the projects that the, the, the government are leading on, health are very much involved in those projects. Yes, Ms McConnell. Uh, thank you. Just a supplementary comment, if I, if I may, convene. Uh, just to, to further sort of expand on, on the, the answer to the question, you know, within prisons, in terms of prison staff, particularly prison officers, we have a cadre of staff who are highly skilled, highly trained, highly experienced, and yet for the most part, we, we restrict and uh, restrain their uh, impact within, to within prison walls. And I think the discussion that we're beginning to have within justice is, again, looking at that uh, resource it more widely, how might we use that resource more widely across the justice system, both within uh, the prison walls, but also out there in the community mm -hmm. working with partners. Now, that discussion is already taking place. I now call it's, um, John Finney, followed by Alison McInnes. John? Thank you, uh, convener. Uh, my question is to Mr McKenrick. Uh, Mr McKenrick, we've heard a lot of uh, partnership collaborative working, and that's all to be commended, and, uh, and, uh, and I think across a range of activities, that's <coughs> Um, important. As a former local authority councillor, uh, I'm aware the silos inevitably and, and in many walks of life build up. And my question is about preventative spend, because we have heard that there's significant sums of money being made uh, available to the criminal justice system. But if we were looking from a, a preventative spend, you'd go right back to issues around education and housing, which are key to that. And clearly, if you have a a female offender with a, a child, then the GERFEC principles would would immediately kick in the, the, the uh, involvement of other agencies. What engagement do you have with, for instance, your housing um, departments, uh, um, your association, uh, and education, right at the very earliest source of preventative um, engagement, please? Thank you for your question. I, I mean, I, th I think I would start with uh, one of the comments that you made around about the GIRFEC approach. Uh, the GIRFEC approach, is, as the committee will be aware, is about a lead professional and it's about how that professional integrates and communicates with others involved in the care of children and indeed, uh, uh, given, the, given the circumstances we were talking about, uh, carers of those children. So uh, the first approach would be that the, the justice service recognises the imperative around the GIRFEC approach and it has a, a, a pivotal role to play in relation to that. Uh, many local authorities will have different forms of structures, but all of them will have a responsibility around how they provide integrated services. So the connection between uh, council services as well as other partners is well established through planning structures and local authorities, and that in the main is where the discussions will take place around about how services connect. Over and above that, the CGAs provide us with an opportunity in which to engage other providers of services, including housing and uh, other forms of education, not necessarily education council related services, but colleges and other employment opportunities to give another example of areas in which we'll collaborate. So those forums around the GIRFEC approach, the planning structures that are available in local authorities and the additional uh, aspect of CGA and the local political accountability provide a platform in which we are able to engage and look beyond the, ser the service user as an offender within the court system and begin to tackle some of the support services that are available uh, in order to meet the needs assessed for that individual that's in front of us. So I would argue that there is, there is plenty of scope for that integration. I'd also argue that there's plenty of effect given to partnership across the country in relation to it. And I think that, that nevertheless, there still remains challenges around how collaborative all of that works in practice. And I would repeat, the whole notion of the Community Justice Centre provides a platform in which uh, for that to be delivered specifically to women who offend. Thanks very much. Thank it's plenty scope. Why hasn't it happened in all the time I've been in this parliament? I mean, I, I sometimes think I'm, I don't know if Ms Donahue feels the same, that I'm back, you know, in Groundhog Day, 
why has it not happened? I mean, it all seems very sent common sense to integrate, to make sure people have housing benefit, to make sure somebody's meeting them outside prison, to make sure the mental health issues are dealt with and all that stuff. So you said collaborative are the difficulties. Well, what's going to change? Well, I suppose I don't have an exact question. I'd be a much more talented individual if I had the exact answer to the particular question, given that it's vexed uh, everybody around this room for quite some time. What, what I'm uh, reflecting upon is the current culture that's already here, and I think that other uh, witnesses have already made a, a comment around the current environment in which we operate on, sponsored by the Commission's report. So whilst it's right that the infrastructure has been there for some time, we're almost in a new dawn in relation to the, that infrastructure and the, the collaborative responsibilities. But in any form of partnership working, different partners will bring priorities, demands, resource allocation in relation to it. So in some respects, how we uh, agree a common vision and how we fund that common vision has been the difficulty in being able to make a connection between the platforms that exist and the delivery mechanisms in which to ma uh, manage better outcomes. That appears to me to be the challenge. And we've got a great catalyst in the Commission's report that provides us with a, a new opportunity in which to uh, elicit some of the good work that we've, that we've done in the past and some of the helpful structures that are around in which to deliver the outcomes that we should be delivering. Is it possible to say that the Commission's report, together with the necessity to really look at budgets across all portfolios now, may in fact concentrate minds? Absolutely, and I, I think that uh, we, we can't just see the Commission's report in separation to that. I mean, we can also see the public sector reform agenda as part of that as well. So I do feel that, uh, that we're in a situation where uh, we can concentrate minds. Okay, I just, I'm such a cynic these days, but you know, we'll see how it goes. Um, can I have, it's uh, Alison McInnes, who's really pioneered and, and has made this our... Not your raison d'etre, but you've, you've, you person who's brought Court and Vale partly in the committee to the front, and then Graham Pearson. Thank you so very Alice. much for that, Convener. And let me first of all apologise to, to panel members that I wasn't able to be here um, for, for all of your evidence. But I do want um, to focus on, on Court and Vale and on the Justice Secretary's um, proposals for dealing with um, the consultation that has just come back um, on, on uh, women offenders. So we now know that the Minister favours a step solution, so in the short term, um, necessary interim infrastructure improvements at Quantum Vale. In the medium term, the use of HMP Inverclyde um, as, as I'm not clear, a national um, specialist prison or for all of the, the, the people at Quantum Vale at the moment. And then that longer term um, proposal that there might well be a national prison in either Quantum Vale or in Glasgow. Um, can the panel, um, members of the panel, let me know what they think of that proposal and then perhaps I could explore some of the budgetary implications of, of that. I'd probably best go first <coughs> since I, I suggested that approach to, to the Cabinet Secretary and, wow. and he's accepted it. <laughs> um, so may I come? You may live to regret that confession, but <laughs> there we go. Yes. Um, I mean, <laughs> going back to uh, two issues, really, one, one about Corn Vale in, in particular, I mean, it really isn't fit for purpose. And I mean, I'm grateful that you know, yourself and uh, Brigadier Munro and others have, have continued to, to beat the drum uh, about that. And I'm really pleased that SPS can at last, in a sense, step up to the challenge and, and do something about it. And of course, uh, as already been commented on, the, uh, the fantastic catalyst of Dame uh, Commission's report gives us that, that landscape in which to move forward. But I suppose it's back to Brigadier Munro's brave uh, decisions and uh, stepping forward. Now, we could uh, spend some more time thumb-sucking in terms of what we might do uh, in the long term and a, a grand and complicated strategy for addressing every single issue uh, along the way. But what this is, is a pragmatic, dynamic, uh, targeted uh, approach to address uh, a very needy and drastic set of circumstances, and that is the fact that Cornt Vale isn't fit for purpose. So it's a three-pronged approach. The first is, let's make Cornt Vale as a living environment as good as we can in the short term, because we can't deliver anything in the short term. But we can do something really impactful that will really make a difference in the medium term, 
And why is that possible? That's because we already have a prison, in a sense, being designed at Inverclyde, notwithstanding the fact that was designed or uh, primarily being designed for, for men. So I think in meeting the challenge of uh, Brigadier Monroe, that bold decision, uh, what we've proposed, which the Cabinet Secretary has accepted, is actually that's the Conton Vale replacement. Why? Because by and large we've got the money already allocated to get that off the ground. It gives us a reasonably close, fantastic leap forward in uh, services and environment for women in custody. And it gives us that central hub, that national prison that Dame Ailish recommends, if you like, the sort of hub and spokes approach. So it gives us the opportunity to have a national prison within about four years with a number of regional facilities themselves purpose designed to address the very particular uh, needs of women passing through our care and custody. And provides that opportunity, as I say, within about a four year or so time window. Now, the alternative to that was sticking with SPS's existing plans, which effectively would see us in 2019 or 2020 before we saw a substantial step change in the provision uh, of purpose-built accommodation uh, for women, probably associated with, with the replacement at HMP Glasgow, uh, should that come to pass. So this really is a dynamic and, uh, I, I think, upfront that step by SPS to meet the challenges of Dame Eilish, to meet the challenges of the Chief Inspector and together and with our partners really make a step change in how we care for uh, women who pass through the care of custody. Thank you. Any other comments? The budgetary implications then you say are none? Because it's been built anyway or what? The, the, bud the budget, so just, just to touch on that, uh, Kavina, the budgetary implications for SPS within the current uh, budget round uh, are, to all intents and purposes, minimal. Uh, because those, those monies already exist in the system and were being allocated for the purpose of building a prison in Reclite. Of course, as we specialise uh, the prison for women, there will be uh, costs that are not yet factored in. And the Cabinet Secretary comments on that, that we have to take those issues uh, into account. And I've provided that in my evidence to you. But by and large, the money to make that initial move within the current budget round is already there. We will have to bid for additional funds, as we would anyway, in the next budget round. But I do not foresee in the early phases any difficulty with the funding. Uh, yes, I'll, I'll take Kate Donoghue and then I'll take uh, Anne Pinkman. Kate, Donna, um, please. I've, I've already, we've already begun to make the plans um, to change the environment in Quarantine Vale to improve it dramatically. Um, I don't intend um, to spend, and nor, nor would the Chief Executive allow me to spend ridiculous amounts of money, but you don't actually have to do that to make a significant improvement to what's there already. So discussions are taking place. Um, literally things are beginning to change as I speak. So um, that's an exciting part of the project too, very quickly to make the environment and the conditions both for the staff who are working there and the women who are living there considerably better. Then we have the opportunity to input to the design of Inverclyde, which will be specifically purpose-built for women. And that gives us an opportunity to take best practice in prison building and design from other jurisdictions so that we have in Scotland, I hope, what will be. And what I, um, a convener will remember we called or hope to um, have Cornwall become, which was a centre of excellence. And I think there's absolutely no reason why that cannot be, because there are many staff um, really unsung working with Corton Vale women just now who are entirely capable of, of creating that centre of excellence. And c can I just, before I forget to do so, and it's a very important thing to say, that we really haven't talked very much about um, the involvement of third sector partners. Um, and they're very important. They're working with uh, women offenders in Greenock, in Edinburgh, and currently in Corton Vale. And they're going to have a tremendously important part to play in the collaborative effort of, of all the interested parties in taking the whole um, situation forward.
Uh, yes, I might come to the third sector in a, in a moment. I'll take Anne Pinkman first. Yeah, um, as uh, one of the chief officers of all of the eight community justice authorities in Scotland, um, I'm able to say that we very much welcome the proposals for the um, development of the prison estate for women offenders. We recognise fully that improvements were absolutely necessary. I would say, however, our only concern would be that we don't create a female estate that sees an increase in numbers of women being sent to custody. If we make it too attractive, i.e. if we provide a woman a, a mother and baby unit, the, the, there is no perverse incentive, as it were, for sentences to increase the number of pregnant women sent to custody. So a note of caution. Um, the smaller community-based facing units that Colin made mention of, again, are very welcome. That does allow tremendous opportunity for agencies, including the third sector, to continue to work with women going into prison, whilst they're in prison, and when they come out. So a real through-the-gate support is much easier to deliver if, set, if the, the, the units are closer to, 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 to the home, to the area from which the woman um, comes from, than if they're all located in a single national prison. Human Monroe, I think you wanted to come in. Really, just to say, I, I sometimes think I need to pinch myself to see what we've got to, listening to what's going on here. I mean, I think it is a remarkable change mm -hmm. over th over three years. I'm sorry, I'm sorry it's taken so long to get there, but there's a, I think the chief executive here is, is is leading a transformational change, not just in physicality, but in in a, in, in a way of thinking. And I think that's what that's what the change is. I think this we've heard the word collaborative working, integrated effort. I think that it is an extraordinary change of mindset. Uh, the fact that um, we're even prepared to take in the short term serious changes to Court and Vale to make it more acceptable, uh, to make it more acceptable to families uh, as well as to uh, offenders who are there and obviously therefore to staff is a remarkable turnaround in my view. Um, and of course having had a chance now to read the Cabinet Secretary's note, uh, I think the plan seems to me to be uh, the best possible uh, uh, available and um, uh, whilst the Chief Inspector never uh, would comment on a on, on, on a plan or inspect a, 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 a brave thought. I think I would um, endorse what, what is going on there and I look forward to, to seeing those improvements on the ground that we've all been hoping for for so many years. Yes, of course, yeah, yeah. I, I think I absolutely share the, the, the comments that um, Brigadier Monroe says and, and, and I would pay tribute to the, um, the, the role that he has played in bringing this change about. It, the appalling circumstances in Corton Vale, um, it's long overdue that they, they, they were addressed and I really welcome um, Colin McConnell's um, commitment to it because I think up until now, I, th I don't think it's that long ago, perhaps this time last year, sitting with SPS in front of us and them not having any priority at all. I mean, complete neglect of the issues that were in Quantum Vale. So a real turnaround there in, in the SPS thinking, and that's absolutely vital if we're to make the changes. If I might just look at some of the detail, um, I would be interested to know how far ahead the planning for Inverclyde was and how, how possible it is to make the, the, the really necessary changes for, for a women's prison and the costs of that. And the other issues are the costs for the visitor centre at Cornton Vale as it stands at the moment. Now, I know that there's a lot of voluntary um, money being put into that, but will the gap be, be filled and will we have a, a visitor centre at Cornton Vale in the very near future? answer certainly on the broad issues and if Kate uh, wants to, to talk about the detail. Uh, if effectively uh, Inverclyde uh, hadn't got beyond the basic planning phase um, and that's not unusual because SPS has got pretty good at building prisons and particularly building prisons for men because that's the business it's, it's been in primarily. Uh, so a lot of lessons had been learned and some of the stuff was, was sort of off, off the shelf in terms of the, the, the fundamental planning uh, for uh, Inverclyde. And of course, there was good reason for that because it's unit cost constraint and so on and so forth. But in a sense, we, we have a footprint uh, already. We know where the prison's going to be. The land's already secured. The, uh, the building permission's already been secured, so on and so forth. So... Whilst there will be um, 
an additional uh, cost, in a sense, to stop the planning process, i.e. drawing things on a, a piece of paper that the, the sort of architects do, um, that, that cost is, frankly, minimal in the scheme of things that we are, we are talking about here. Uh, and I haven't brought the detail uh, with me, but if, if the committee would want to know what it is, I can, I can write to you. But just to give you an assurance that whilst um, I, I did stop uh, the planning process for the, the male prison uh, at Inverclyde in order to give us this breathing space for the consultation, that hasn't really cost us in terms of the ultimate delivery uh, timescale for Inverclyde. And we're still confident that we can uh, uh, design and build and uh, commission Inverclyde uh, by the end of 2016, which is still within the sort of timescale that we would have been considering uh, for the male prison. Uh, the, the costs, uh, as I've shared with the, the committee already, for Inverclyde will be somewhere between 70 and 80 million. Uh, and we would have been bidding for that funding stream in the next budget round uh, regardless. Uh, but what we will do, uh, we will not shy away from asking for additional resources, even in the uh, uh, difficult economic environment that we're in, if we believe that in asking for additional resources, we can really give women in custody and therefore the Scottish community some real payback on those resources in the years to come. Reverse incentives. I mean, HMP Inverclyde was um, supposed to um, be catered for 300 mm -hmm. prisoners. Um, I would hope that we would not need to cater for that many uh, women prisoners. What, what kind of figures are you catering well, for? Well, I think, actually, and I'm not, I don't wish to be controversial, but I, w I wish to be practical in the sense that we have to run a service that's capable of um, servicing uh, the courts. So uh, Inverclyde will have to be... Uh, capable of uh, managing uh, a women's population of around 300. Um, and that's simply because we have somewhere between, uh, anywhere between 430 and 480 uh, women in custody currently. So we've got to build a capacity that can address uh, that sort of level of population. Now, what I would hope for in the future, as other policies uh, justice policies more widely uh, come to bear, uh, then we will be able to look again at how we use uh, the custodial facilities around the country differentially. But we must build uh, or plan to build uh, a Quant Vale replacement that can, that can manage a women's population of around 300. Uh, if I might, Damien Lish's um, commission um, envisaged that we would actually have a very small specialist prison um, as the national resource that would only deal with long-term and, and dangerous offenders. Um, that, that sounds as if that's slightly adrift from what Dame Eilish was suggesting. Well, 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 it is to a degree. And, of course, you know, what I put to the, the Cabinet Secretary is based on the experience <laughs> of, of running prisons and running a prison service. And so we've had to, um, in a sense, uh, think about how we best deliver Dame uh, recommendations, both in spirit and actuality. And the proposals, the sort of hub and spokes uh, proposal, is very much in keeping with, with Dame uh, recommendations. But we recognise in running an efficient and effective and an affordable service going forward that our proposals, whilst they don't meet uh, the fine detail of what Dame Eilish would, would want, I, I think in broad, in broad sense they do. Because yeah. I want to keep to the budget yes. one. I okay. know it's, it's sorry, sorry. one wants to get okay. into all that, but we have got the Cabinet Secretary to answer all these questions okay. about sorry. how we sorry. deal in, in the general with all the range of women offenders. So if I may move back to the budget, uh, and Graham Pearson and John... F oh, you've got... Is this a budget, budget question one, on right? the Visitor Centre. And, and then, the yes, Visitor Centre, right? And then I've got then, Graham Pearson and John Finn. I hope that that fatal words will be the last question because we'll be running into one o'clock. This. Funding um, a person to work in the visitor centre. SPS is going to fund um, staff 
for the visitor centre. And the visitor centre actually, um, although it's not just going to be a visitor centre, I hope to, to make it a community hub as well as a visitor centre. Um, it is actually a building outside Cornton Vale at the moment. It used to be the, the staff restaurant. It's a lovely building. Um, and it's just ideal for the purpose. So the money is available and um, the chief executive has made money uh, available for its refunding, uh, for its refurbishing rather. And we've already started to, to do the roof. In fact, I think it finishes today. So that's how quickly we're moving on. But funding is there, so are the staff, and so is the collaboration with the local community because it really is the local interfaith community um, as long, uh, along with CJA and others who have worked together to get this um, moving. So it's moving very fast. Thank you. There we are. There you go. Uh, Graham Pearson, can you move very fast? On, on three separate issues, I can move very quickly <laughs> and come back to Ms McConnell. First of all, can I say that I think his approach is bold. One often hears these words used in government, and when you look at the detail, you're often disappointed. But I think that you, you have taken a very bold step here and one that uh, I don't uh, find much to argue about. There must have been in budgetary terms uh, a strategic reason for, for the original HMP at the Inverclyde. So looking back at that business case and the, uh, the community it was designed to service, who lost and what are you going to do about that? The Inverclyde was actually uh, designed as a replacement for Greenock. Um, so in terms of the, the quid pro quo, uh, Greenock will continue to run for a time yet. So in a sense... The life. Yes. So, and Greenock actually is in reasonable nick, if, if I'm... Well, it's a bit of a pun there. I didn't, oh, I didn't, that was good. I didn't, I didn't no, that was good. <laughs> um, just check my notes here. Yeah, um, so it's 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 in reasonably good uh, reasonably good condition, and I, uh, in talking to the governor uh, locally and uh, other uh, senior staff, uh, I, I I think it's reasonable and reasonable value to the public purse that we extend uh, the life of Greenock. So in a sense, there's no losses there, and seeing where you're going with the questioning. Um, essentially, we're, we're creating a new facility for women who pass into our care uh, in, in SPS. We, we do not envisage in the future parallel running in the long term between Cont Vale and uh, um, uh, Inverclyde. So there's a relationship there between running cost and running cost, and one would, one would cover the other. Um, a second question about budgets. There was a mention earlier about well-established systems and collaborative working and so forth. And you touched on the skills of prison officers, um, and perhaps we don't use those skills to the full extent that we might otherwise. I think that certainly my own experience of speaking to prisoners, both women and men, um, seemed to indicate it was some very basic services that were missing. That it wasn't the kind of things that were intellectually challenging. Provision of a house at the time of being released, mm -hmm. the connection between the health service within the prison, external to the prison, the uh, connection to the uh, benefit system and so forth. It seems to me that although we've got these well-established systems and collaborative working that John Finney touched on earlier, the key seems to be the authority to shift budgets between the kingdoms. Is there any sense that... Uh, that will be achieved in the foreseeable future, that on top of this well-being, good nature and bonhomie, can we actually begin to shift money into things that work and will services let that money go? Well, I, th I think, I think that's, your, your, uh, that's a rifle shot approach in, in the sense you've got right to one of the core issues. And you know, it's very tempting as Chief Executive of the SPS to say, that money's that money's mine, and you know you can't touch it. Um, but as as already been commented on, I think other um, senior leaders are beginning to take a different approach, just as I am, which is to say, you know that money's been allocated to run services as they currently are, but those services aren't set in stone. And you know together we need to re envisage, uh, re-envisioning how those services might be delivered in the future. So I'm saying as Chief Exec of the SPS, that's what that money does now. 
but it doesn't have to always do that. And the point I make about um, skilled prison officers is that somewhere around 70 to 72 percent of the resources that come to the SPS buy people, but they buy a range of skills and capacities and abilities. And I think it's it's a challenge to us all to imagine how those skills and abilities can be more impactfully applied across the system. So I would say, yes, we can get access to those resources uh, and that money in a different way. I don't know if anybody else wants to comment. Yes, it was an excellent description of a rifle shot. I mean, I think that that really is the matter as to how you pull budgets across, you know, an ever decreasing budget framework. I, I mean, again, I don't wish to repeat the sense of message that's around about much more collaborative and a government who's looking for, for that type of collaborative approach. But it is very difficult and challenging. Indeed, the example that we've just heard around the, the prison itself having the figure of 300 and the concerns that that may well be used to its maximum that moves away from the Commission's observation that many people or many women that are actually in prison are there for low-level nature of offences is a demonstration of the challenge that's around about how we pull that understanding, that collaborative uh, approach to implementing policy that gives best effect and is, is best evidence-based. I'm sorry to interrupt, but can I come back with a very simple example that was given to us in, in one of our visits? And on this occasion, it was a, a man who shared it with us, but I think it applies to women too. And being released from prison, what he was offered was a, a sleeping bag on a floor of a homeless persons unit for three nights. That just seems completely unacceptable and therefore unsurprising that that individual might spin back into prison within the week. Mm -hmm. There's no multi-million pound system to deliver on that. Mm -hmm. it, it just takes, you know, banging heads together. The, the date of release was no surprise. It was on the calendar for some months. Yet it seems to be, where did that come from? It's that kind of collaborative working that seems simple but illusory and, I think, reflects the frustration from the convener that she's been dealing with this for far too many years. It's, I mean, I, I hear what Ms McConnell says, and it, it sounds like an opportunity. <coughs> it's, it's now delivering on that in terms of real commitment rather than just words. Ms Pinkman. Um, you're absolutely right to highlight the issue of, of housing. It has been uh, an issue forever. Um, we can organise, arrange the most sophisticated release packages for individuals coming out of prison, but without accommodation, you've built a house of cards. And if I've said that once over the years, I've said it a thousand times. As CJs, we have worked with local authorities, but you have 32 different local authorities, 32 different local authority housing services. But we have introduced, and Ailish Angelou did comment very favourably on this in her report, on the, the various housing protocols that are now being being established within within the CG areas and working with the prisons, um, housing services. Information is now being shared at a much more detailed level than was ever previously the case. The housing services now know when individuals go into prison and they now know when individuals are due for release. And that allows housing services to plan. It's a win-win for them because if they have, if they don't know that individuals have gone into into, into custody, they can um, the 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 the, the, the <coughs> rent arrears can be accrued, houses can become abandoned, um, and the, the the tenancies can be used for the house can be used for parties or whatever. So they can secure tenancies, etc. And I know in my own my own local area, Fife. Um, Five Housing now have a, 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 a managed offenders team and they have an officer who goes into um, Glenocal, Perth um, and Gla uh, Edinburgh prisons on a regular basis to see all the prisoners who are willing to be seen from that area to address their housing needs. Now, there is a shortage of housing, but at least they are starting that ball rolling. They are preventing individuals from accruing rent arrears um, on admission to prison and making what plans they can to address the housing needs of prisoners on their release. And I'm not aware of, of any arrangements such as the, the, the awful um, arrangements you've just outlined ever being um, arranged in, in, in Fife. So that's, that is happening. It is a challenge, 
but things are improving. We've just recently established a housing officer post in Cornton Vale. One of the challenges is that many of the prisons are, are national prisons, so you're trying to make arrangements for women or, or, or men, indeed, going back to every local authority area in Scotland. So we now have a, a, a housing post in Cornton Vale to address the housing needs of women on admission and on release from prison. It will not be a magic wand, but it's a very much a step in the right direction. On desk, um, it was at the mall. That's it. Oh, heavens, that didn't seem as long as I thought it was going to be. Um, and that's us. So um, I want to thank you all for your evidence. I'm not going to ask if... Is there anything you want to... Let's just say to the panel in the dying minutes. Is there anything you think we ought to have asked about the budget? Rather than just, you know, how we deal with women offenders in the broad art debate, which could be another occasion, but nothing else. Good. Excellent. Thank you very much. And uh, as agreed, I now thank you for your attendance. Thank you very much. And we now move into private session.